ABC News, Decision Night in America. Here's Lester Holt. And here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Decision Night in America here at NBC's Democracy Plaza. It is 7 p.m. in the east. The polls have just closed in six states, and we have our first projections up in the iconic face of 30 Rockefeller Plaza. NBC News projects that Donald Trump will win the state of Indiana. When the votes are counted, we project that Donald Trump will win in Kentucky as well. Vermont goes to Hillary Clinton, the projected winner in Vermont. We're watching Virginia. The polls have closed there too early to call Clinton, however, leading in Virginia. Georgia, also too close to call. And South Carolina, too early to call. Trump leads in South Carolina. All night long, they'll be watching the race to 270 electoral votes. Here's how it stands based on those calls. Trump with 19, Clinton with three. And we map it out on the ice for you on Democracy Plaza. That uh, map will fill in with a lot of red and blue before this night is over. But again, 270 is the magic number that will elect our next president. Let's come on inside and we say a big good evening. I'm Lester Holt alongside our election night team, Savannah Guthrie, Chuck Todd, and Tom Brokaw. Savannah, whatever happens tonight, history is going to be made. I was just thinking about it. We have an unconventional candidate against an unprecedented candidate, and this election has changed so much about our politics. It's upended every assumption you can make. It's redefined what it means to be a Republican or a Democrat in this country, and it will be very exciting to see who turns out tonight, who shows up to vote, what that coalition might look like for a Hillary Clinton or a Donald Trump, and I think we're in for a cliffhanger on the Senate side. Who's going to control the Senate by the end of the day? Chuck set it up for us tonight. Well, I'll tell you, we're going to learn a lot early. I mean, look, we already are learning something right now. I think the quick Indiana call is means that Republicans came home. You know, it was three weeks ago before Comey, Indiana was neck and neck. And the fact that we can call it poll close, that is a sign. Republicans came home. This is Mike Pence's home state. But look at Virginia and Georgia. And we may be talking about this story. The southeast corner of the United States over the last 12 years, we have seen this battleground map change. And now, Welcome Georgia to that battleground, joining Florida, Virginia, North Carolina along that Atlantic seaboard. We're going to be spending a lot of time tonight, and how quickly those races get called will tell us how long this night's going to be on the presidential front. And, Tom, a lot of big themes that will extend far beyond 2016 we'll be watching tonight. Well, this country has been simmering for some time, and this election is not going to end all of that. The question is, does it boil over depending on who wins? And I think that's the real test for whoever wins this race. It's also the test for the country. They've got to figure out how they want to come together. You know, there's a lot of absence of confidence in the institutions of governance. Fifty-four percent of the people said recently they would defeat every member of Congress, Republican or Democrat alike. So whoever wins tonight, going forward from here, is going to have to find a way to reach across the lines to the red state or blue states, because there are a lot of each, however you look at the map, and get them to work together toward a common goal. That's the big, big challenge, Lester. All right. Hallie Jackson is in our newsroom here with a full team working on reporting the story of the night. Hey, Hallie. Hi, Lester. We have our team of correspondents blanketing the country coast to coast, not just at polling places and election watch parties, but in all the key battleground states and, of course, at campaign headquarters. I'll be digging through exit polls here, and this is the engine room of our election center. We have our vote watch unit here led by Cynthia McFadden, my colleague Pete Williams, checking for any voting irregularities, any legal implications or issues that might pop up. And this is our political unit with our pollsters diving into all the data. Consider this home base where we'll be bringing you all of our coverage for the next seven hours maybe more lester okay hallie thanks very much we're keeping a close eye on clinton and trump election headquarters manhattan's a pretty small town right there they're all located just a short distance from each other and us here in midtown so let's check in with them now starting with andrea mitchell at clinton headquarters hello andrea good evening lester uh, this is the night that hillary clinton has been waiting for uh, she is in a midtown hotel with her husband of course former president clinton and other close friends and family but they're hoping this will not be a nail biter but we've learned that they have written two speeches they're hoping of course that it is a victory speech that she declares and that she is able to finally shatter that glass ceiling and the convention center here has a glass ceiling so that is the symbolism of what they're trying to do and hope to accomplish tonight the real issue is what happens in places like north carolina they see north carolina as the tightest of the battleground states they say that they are confident but where they have gone in the last 24 hours tells the story we were at one o'clock
this morning at a rally in North Carolina, in Raleigh, North Carolina, and earlier in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, former Pennsylvania Governor Ed Rendell telling me that that is not a done deal. They can't take Pennsylvania even for granted. So therefore, that big uh, extravaganza with both Obamas and Clintons in front of the Independence Hall in Philadelphia last night and earlier in the day, she went to Pittsburgh. So that tells the story about just how nervous they are. They don't want to leave anything on the table. And they, again, are hoping that she can finally achieve the goal that she has sought uh, so hard for 18 months and, in fact, for decades earlier. Andrew, Andrea Mitchell at the Clinton headquarters tonight in Manhattan. Katie Turr at the Trump headquarters also here in New York. Hello, Katie. Hey there, Lester. Donald, Donald Trump is watching the returns come in at Trump Tower. He's uh, surrounded by his family and his close aides. The campaign says that they are confident. They're already touting a record turnout from what they call uh, white Republican counties in New Hampshire and in Michigan. Uh, but I spoke to a couple of New Hampshire sources who tell me they are not as confident as the Donald Trump campaign. They describe that, that state as tense, close, and sickening. I spoke to multiple sources today, both inside and outside the campaign and absolutely everybody believes that this is going to be a tight race. They are focusing on four states, their core four, as Kellyanne Conway puts it, that's Ohio, Florida, Iowa, and North Carolina. From there, they're going to look to Michigan, a blue state that they hope to turn red and get Donald Trump the presidency. But this is a campaign, Lester, that has conceded from the beginning that they are the underdogs, the infrastructure, the money, the electoral map was never in their favor. Katie Turr tonight. Katie, thanks very much. Uh, let's talk now about some of those results we, we uh, ticked off at the top of the hour. I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in Georgia, Chuck, too close to call. Georgia is considered a deep red state. Well, it has been, and there was even the Clinton campaign talked about investing in it, and they said, well, you know what, we need to put more takes more time to put, make Georgia competitive. Barack Obama flirted with it both in 8 and 12. Now it looks like it's firmly in the battleground. I've talked to Republicans. They were surprised. And this last weekend, they were surprised the Clinton campaign didn't make more of a play for Georgia earlier, almost the same way the Democrats have talked about Michigan, like, oh, Trump finally discovered that Michigan is, is a problem for the Democratic side. But here's what we're going to keep, I'm going to keep an eye on. It's outside of Atlanta, Cobb County. This is the among the wealthier suburbs of Atlanta. Cobb is a county that Romney won by double digits. This college educated, the college education split in this electorate. If she carries Georgia, we'll see the evidence in Cobb. She doesn't have to carry Cobb, but it has to become a swing county for her to win Georgia. We'll find out. It's been fascinating watching over the last couple of days where these campaigns go, what they're worried about, or what the other side makes them think they should be worried about. I'm thinking of the, the to-do list that's got so many things left off of it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you're going to hear Chuck talk about these suburbs all night long because that ultimately might be one of the stories that emerges here. Whether or not Hillary Clinton can pull more of those married white women that might have traditionally voted Republican into her corner, if she can, that's potentially a factor that could be decisive and they've all kind of once again gone to the same battlegrounds and yet we're starting to see the glimmers of new demographic battlegrounds as I just mentioned and also new geographic battlegrounds Chuck talked about Georgia Arizona got a late visit from Hillary Clinton Arizona hasn't voted for a Democrat since 1996 when Bill Clinton ran for re-election so I think we're gonna see a lot of that kind of conventional thinking about politics and the map potentially upended tonight Tom well, you, what you see tonight and what Chuck was just talking about is the transformation of the American political map. This country is changing at warp speed. Look at the Hispanic vote. It's an enormously important vote now. Republicans have rejected the Hispanics going back to Pete Wilson when he was governor of California, ran hard against migrants in California. And a lot of Republicans said, we lost a constituency that belonged to us. These are family-oriented people. They're very faithful. They work hard. And we've given them to the Democrats by our attacks on them. Then you look at women now taking a more prominent place in politics, not just in the Congress of the United States, the number of governors around the country, the number of women who are the heads of major corporations, big bankers. More than half the law school classes now are filled with women.
there's one of them, <laughs> <laughs> and doctors as well. So that is a changing map that is going on out there, and these two candidates have been running behind the curve, in my judgment, and not reaching out to figure out how they're going to get ahead of the constituency that is out there looking for somebody who can deliver to them the future that they know that they could have. All right, Chuck, walk me through the states that, that really could determine this thing tonight. Yeah, I, look, I think we, we, we know. We've talked about Florida, but I, I kind of want to build on this uh, larger point here because we know that I think, uh, in, in just in this respect, if Clinton wins this election, she's going to win it because of this Southeast Corridor. And if Donald Trump wins this election, it's going to be because he overperforms. In the, I mean, that's what's going on here, is that we've seen the growth states, diverse states, the, these, these southeastern states are becoming more diverse. The, the difference in Georgia and North Carolina and Florida and Virginia isn't going to be African-American vote. It's going to be Hispanic vote. And then up here, there isn't a lot of Hispanic vote in Michigan. There isn't a lot of Hispanic vote in Pennsylvania. That is what's given Trump real uh, chances in both Michigan and Pennsylvania, Iowa and Ohio. So we are seeing, and by the way, the map may look very similar to 2012 when it's all said and done, but I want to emphasize what Tom said. There's a lot going on underneath, and these state maps are going to look a lot different once we start seeing real numbers come in. For what it's worth, very little actual vote is in. I'm keeping a huge eye, for instance, on Florida because we're actually seeing more vote come in right now in Florida than anywhere else. But again, 2% in, so, and as you can see, it's all coming from essentially one semi-rural county. Yeah, and right now, a lot of what we're dealing with is anecdotal uh, uh, conversation about what's been happening in these states. Let's go to Kerry Sanders now as we begin to sweep around some of these battleground states. Kerry is in Florida. What are you seeing there? Well, the polls closed at 7 o'clock where I am. Inside, there's about a half dozen voters still inside. About a minute before they closed the polls, they made an announcement. Two people literally sprinted inside. The reason they're still inside voting is, while it's the presidential election that everybody's watching, of course, the vote itself, the ballot is rather long, so it can take up to 20, 30 minutes for some people to actually vote here. Remember, Florida has two time zones. So while the polls have closed here, as you go out to the panhandle, the polls are still open for, uh, well, till 7 o'clock that time, and then people can continue to vote as long as they've been in line. It's likely that we're going to have a pretty long night here because of how close things are. I'm along the I-4 corridor, and while it's all indications are that the real determination of who's going to take the state will be along this corridor. And as you were just talking, the Hispanic vote may actually turn this state. And interestingly, it is those Puerto Ricans who have moved along the I-4 corridor that are really likely to perhaps determine who wins or loses here. Consider this fact. Since they've had their economic problems on the island there, about 7,000 Puerto Ricans a month have been leaving that island and many of them coming here. In fact, with the current projections, we may wind up having the largest Puerto Rican diaspora here, not in New York, where they are still the largest group of uh, uh, Hispanics. Tell me, how much have you seen of, of the ground game that we hear so much about, this getting out the vote effort? Well, the ground game on the Democratic side has been much stronger than on the Republican side. Hillary Clinton's teams have actually gone door to door and had people in cars bringing voters out to the polls, where on the Republican side, it's been a little bit more of people being self-motivated to come out. And I think it'll be very interesting because Donald Trump made it very clear that he thought his supporters would just show up at the polls because he saw such huge crowds and many of them, of course, showing up in this state. We'll see whether that translates into the votes that he thinks will result. Kerry Sanders, thanks very much. Let's move on up to North Carolina, another part of the country that Chuck was circling for us a minute ago. Uh, Rahema Ellis is there. Rahema, tell us what you've seen there uh, throughout the day. Well, I can tell you the polls are still open here. And early this morning when polls did open, it was a long line of people here. Later on, not so much, but it was steady. And officials say it's been like that statewide. They say it's primarily because there's been a record all-time early voting here in this state with 17 voting days before today. It's added up to 45% of registered voters here in North Carolina who cast their votes before this day, making this a toss-up state for Clinton and for Trump. I can tell you what happened when I talked to some folks who came out of there who had voted, the Republican and Clinton voters alike. They said they were happy they had voted, but more than that, they're relieved this is over.
Lester? All right, Rahema Ellis for us, and the polls uh, close in North Carolina at 7.30 Eastern, just about 15 minutes away, 15 electoral votes there. Tammy Leitner is at a polling place in Manchester, New Hampshire. We have seen a lot of movement, Tammy, there over the last week or so, and it's a notoriously hard place uh, uh, for pollsters to predict. What are you seeing? You know, Lester, New Hampshire is still a wild card. We've been speaking with voters all afternoon, and I can tell you one thing. This state is divided. Now, keep in mind, this is where Trump got his start. This is where he won his first primary. Also something to keep in mind, 40% of the voters here are undeclared, which is why both candidates have been making such a push here. Trump has been here nine times. President Obama was here yesterday campaigning for Clinton. And I can tell you that they are both making a run at this state. One other thing we want to mention, Lester, is the crucial Senate race. I can tell you that tonight, when these polls close, everybody is going to be looking at New Hampshire to see, one, who's in the White House, and two, who takes control of the Senate. Lester? Lightner. Tammy, thanks very much. We are here at our NBC News Election Center, barely getting started. We're awaiting more poll closings. We're going to dig into the exit polling coming up, see what we can glean from that. We're learning some very interesting things about what voters are thinking. Stay with us as we cover the final hours of this historic battle for the White House between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Two parties, two candidates, and one prize. Decision Night in America continues right here on NBC. Democracy Plaza, welcome back now from our NBC News Election Center. Hallie Jackson is in the newsroom. She and her team have been digging into some of the exit polling we're getting. Hallie, what do you got? Hey, Lester, we're looking at three big themes tonight, really. The first is going to be character for each of the candidates. Remember, this entire campaign, each candidate has tried to paint the other as basically unfit for the presidency. We'll take a look at these numbers of honest and trustworthy. You can see voters nationwide found 60% of them, rather, found Hillary Clinton to be not honest or trustworthy. So that means six in 10 voters uh, feel this way. Look at Donald Trump. His numbers are roughly the same, a little bit higher. Uh, this is still Clinton again, but for Donald Trump, it's 64% of people who feel that way. So what does this mean? It means that there is still a considerable character problem, no matter who ends up in the White House. We also want to talk, and you can see the Trump numbers here behind me. Another theme we're going to be hitting tonight are Hispanic voters. You heard Chuck talking about that earlier this hour, how key the Latino vote will be. Right now, we do see those Hispanic voters breaking for Hillary Clinton. Not so surprising. What we are watching is whether Trump underperforms Mitt Romney back in 2012. Right now, no indication that he is. But remember, it is still early in the evening. These are our early exits, which means we're still waiting on some of those West Coast figures to come in. The final point I want to make here, we are closely watching what happens with college-educated white women. This is kind of a swing group that went for Barack Obama in 2008, Mitt Romney in 2012, and look where they are breaking right now. For Hillary Clinton, by eight points. She has flipped that group from last cycle, but take a look at where Trump is doing better. It's with the non-college-educated white women. He's up over Hillary Clinton by 24 points, according to our early exit polls. This is decisive for him, and it illustrates, guys, that this is not so much a gender gap that we'll be talking about tonight, but really more of an education gap when it comes to these white women voters. Are those numbers struck by those numbers about honesty that Trump and Clinton basically reviewed the same by the voters, but she's the one that was seen to be labeled with with the truth issue. Well, by the way, Donald Trump has made a meal out of that. I mean, he has called her crooked Hillary for the better part of the general election. But what's interesting is how remarkably stable these negative ratings are. They haven't gone too much higher or too much lower, but let's be clear, they are astronomically high for both of these candidates. They're the two most unpopular presidential candidates in history. They have very high negatives, but in a sense, they're kind of washing each other out since they both are viewed so unfavorably by so many voters. By the way, even some of their own supporters. And, oh, and that's yeah, but that gap matters. The fact that she's less unpopular yes. than him, our pollsters will say, you are right, but at this point, look at the difference of those negatives. That matters. All right, stay with us. We're just getting started. We're minutes away from poll clones because North Carolina and Ohio will characterize those races for you when those polls close. Decision Night in America continues right here on NBC.
Welcome back from our election center. It is 7.30 p.m. in the east, and polls have just closed in three states, including two very important swing states. Let's take you through them right now. The state of Ohio, too close to call at this hour. North Carolina, too early to call. West Virginia, NBC News projects when the votes are counted. Donald Trump wins West Virginia. It's a state where his message played well. Its coal industry has taken a beating. Hillary Clinton made a misstep there when she talked about putting coal workers out of a job. Trump goes, gets West Virginia. As we look at the race to 270 now, we move down to the ice there on Democracy Plaza. The map filling in. Clinton right now with 319 electoral votes to Trump at this early hour in this contest. I want to bring in uh, Nicole Wallace now, who joins our panel right now. I want you all to react to some of the numbers we're seeing coming in from Florida right now, keeping in mind all the polls have not closed there. But we're getting some raw numbers. What are you seeing in these as we put them up here, Chuck? I'm seeing that, it, look, we've got, it's 40% already of the vote in. It's all early vote here. But here's what's not in. We only have about um, five or six. Uh, we have no precincts in Broward County at all. Barely anything out of Miami. What you're seeing now as you're watching this map, we've got Clinton up a point. What that is, is that's where the vote is currently coming in. If you see gray, if you see any gray there, it means we've had zero vote in from there. All that is telling you is who's leading in that county. So as you see there, obviously it's the southeast corner that uh, is about where all the population is, Miami, Broward, and Palm Beach. And as you see, no Broward. That's if she wins Florida, she's going to win it down in South Florida. The fact that she has a lead right now in the raw vote before we have anything out of Broward County you're going to have a lot of nervous Trump people right now and a lot of very, very excited Clinton. People. Nicole, let me ask you, there was a, even Trump himself had said Florida was must win. But then down the stretch here, we saw, let's go to Michigan, looking for other paths and suggesting they might have them. Do they exist or was this a head fake we've well, seen? Well, so even uh, some of Trump's closest advi advisors by mid-afternoon today, we're starting to talk about what if. What if Donald Trump hadn't engaged in a month-long battle against the Khan family? What if Donald Trump hadn't taken uh, so long and really never properly apologized for the access Hollywood? And the what if, the answer to the what if is, what if he'd focused instead on a strategy that remade the map where his economic message, where his direct line into people experiencing economic despair in that upper Midwest, what if they'd had a real campaign that could have targeted their voters and turned out their voters? Then it wouldn't be a lights out moment for them if they come out short in Florida. You've called it the checkmate state, and I agree with that. But this story, if they come up short tonight, will be about a campaign that was, was not lost at the beginning. They, they had the potential to take his economic message to take his outsider message and to turn some states that really haven't been available to Republicans. They could have taken that message in a concerted manner with a real traditional, maybe boring in Trump's eyes, turnout operation. They could have done some of the boring things like stay on strip. They could have done some of the non-sexy things like take away Twitter. And I think that what they will be talking about if they come up short is how they might have been able to remake the map so that states like Florida and North Carolina weren't do or die for them. Did, did, uh, did Donald Trump have his finger on the pulse, Tom? Um, of, of, of what Americans cared about. You know, any number of people. I mean, he ran a brilliant campaign from the ground up at the beginning, but he continued to run through the general election like it was still a primary, that the exactly. voter turnout was exactly. much different in the reality than what he was seeing in front of him. 60% of the people who voted for him today, according to the exit polls and the surveys that we did, thought he did not have the right temperament to be the president of the United States. These are people who voted for him. Any number of Republicans went to him and said, look, you've got to shift gears now. You've got to change. You've got to be different. He has a very strong ego. He knows how well he did giving them the Trump act from state to state to state, but he didn't shift the gear in time for the general election, and he's paying a price for that in some of those states so far. Now, it's not over by any means, but they've got to scramble to win tonight. But to your point, I mean, he was on to something and in so many ways is remaking Republican orthodoxy. I mean, here's a guy who's saying he's against these, against these free trade agreements where free traders were, the, that was an article of faith in the Republican Party. Some of the foreign policy of the traditional Republican Party, he completely upends. And so in, because of some of those positions, he's opening up a path to Rust Belt states that had been going Democratic. And yet there's always is the flip side of it and what he did I mean to Nicole's point it wasn't over before it started because this is an eminently winnable race for a Republican exactly. party in this year I mean actually history is on the side of Republicans 
On the other hand, when he had his very first announcement speech, disparaged Mexicans and, and kind of put those battle lines down, if we see in Florida that the Hispanic vote goes up and that that ends up being decisive, a lot of people will look at this and say, boy, was that lost on the first day at the announcement speech? It is going to be one of the early uh, pieces of this drama. We're going to be watching what's happening in Florida. We want to get around to some of the battleground states now where our correspondents are in Ohio, which we, as we know, the polls... Um, close here a short while ago too close to call we have got uh, NBC's Chris Jansing also Jacob Suboroff standing by in Pennsylvania first to Ohio and Chris uh, providing the drama as it always does Chris boy does it and I can tell you both campaigns are holding their breath right now look this is the heart of the Rust Belt you were just talking about this the union workers who have been really responsive to Donald Trump's message on the other hand I'm standing in Cleveland in Cuyahoga County this is a place where Barack Obama won twice overwhelmingly where the Clinton folks were down at the end of early voting. Now, they had hoped that there would be lines long enough to keep this place open after 730. But as you can see, the door is closed. No one is here. There is some nervousness on their side and a lot of confidence more so than in other states that I'm hearing from the Trump campaign. Having said that, if they're able to pull it out, the Clinton campaign, it's going to be about the ground game. Today they did something really interesting, Lester. They took 400 paid staffers out of the offices, put volunteers in, and sent them out canvassing four different times. If they knocked on the door once and somebody wasn't home, they went back a second time. They believe that ground game can make up one, two, three points. That's what they're holding on to, thinking that there's a chance they could still pull out Ohio, Lester. All right, that, Chris, thanks. Let's go to Jacob now in Pennsylvania. It, it's not a coincidence that the Clinton folks ended in Pennsylvania, and we know as watching Florida that it, it would be critical uh, to a Donald Trump path. Describe what you've been seeing on the ground, Jacob. There's no doubt about it uh, as to the reason that the president and the uh, secretary were here in Philadelphia last night. There were 1,686 election divisions in the city of Philadelphia, Lester, and perhaps this is the one with the longest lines in the entire city right now. This is the main polling location for Temple University in North Philadelphia. And some of these young folks here have told me that they have been online for three to four hours. In fact, somebody just came by and dropped off some pizza for all these uh, students. The line actually snakes around this way, all the way around through this area and down under the overpass down that way. I have to tell you, Lester, that this is central to President Obama and Secretary Clinton's strategy of winning this area. Uh, with Philadelphia, if they can drive up the margins here, particularly amongst these young people uh, that you're seeing right now that are wait have been waiting on this line for hours and hours and hours, they could potentially close the margins that uh, Donald Trump is running up in the center of this state, in the areas between Pittsburgh uh, and Philadelphia. We're going to be watching this all night long. Polls close in less than half an hour here, Lester, but all of the people on this line, like I said, all the way down to that overpass uh, are more than likely uh, and, in fact, are certainly going to be led into this polling place. Lester? Well, they are well fed. That's good to see. All right, Jacob, thanks very much. Hallie Jackson's in the newsroom with another look at some of the exit polling. Hallie, these fascinating stuff coming out of these exit polls. What are you looking at right now? I'm telling you, Lester, right now we're taking a look at how people feel about the federal government. Listen, people don't like the federal government, according to our early exit poll data. Look at this. Two-thirds of folks are either dissatisfied or angry. But keep in mind, this does not mean we are a nation of angry people because only 22% say they're actually mad at government. Let's dive into that slice of the pie, though. And you can see that of those folks who are angry with government, an overwhelming majority of them, 75%, broke for Donald Trump, according to this early data. Donald Trump has run a campaign trying to tap into that voter dissatisfaction, and you are seeing some of that reflected in these early numbers. I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about a key swing state that Chuck brought up earlier in the night, North Carolina, and the gender gap, which is another theme we're following tonight. Take a look at this. You can see Hillary Clinton, uh, essentially of men, most of them went for Donald Trump, according to some of these early exit polls, but it's basically the flip of it for Hillary Clinton. Most women went for her. We are seeing a double-digit gender gap in North Carolina. It's part of the reason why the state is so close, and it's potentially a re reflection of what we've seen this entire campaign.
right. And I see Nicole, you've been pouring through exit polling data on your own, going rogue here. What are you seeing in there? Kevin, yeah. uh, so Savannah and Matt were kind enough to let me follow the mom vote this cycle. And a year ago, I sent a note saying, if you want to look at one group and determine whether a Republican can win back the White House, watch the mom vote. Because the last time it was done, it was George W. Bush, who in 2004 was able to tap into what we called the security mom. Some people call them the NASCAR moms. And it is impossible for a Republican to win the White House without narrowing the gender gap. And, and what I'm looking at so far, it does not look like Trump is on track to do that in enough swing states. I, look, I'm going to quickly go to the map here. I'm going to show one of these counties that have these moms in it. Right. It's in Virginia. Well, moms are everywhere, it is. They are everywhere. <laughs> but I'm going to say the, the moms that I will My argue mom. matter the most. Let me show you quickly. <laughs> Loudoun County. How Loudoun goes, so goes the Virginia. Okay, Obama won Virginia last time, won Loudoun about seven points. Yeah. Look at right now. We got yeah. about a quarter of the vote in Loudoun. Loudoun is basically, you know, college educated. It's a, a pretty high income county, sort of the next suburb out of Arlington and Fairfax in Northern Virginia. And she is up by wow. 16 points, essentially doubling. Now you know why they were pulling out of Virginia. Before we go uh, to the break, show me where, where we stand in the entire state of Virginia. Well, we had it just too early. It has it's it's still too. It's still too early. We have not a ton of vote in here. Let me, uh, let me, here we go, and let's show you here. Here it is. So far, most of the vote that's come in has come in from Republican areas. As you can see, Arlington, we have no vote in at all. Some parts of the Richmond area, no vote. Norfolk area, the strongest Democratic areas have not really come in yet. Only, like I said, I showed that loud because you brought up, I was right. like stunned that already she has a double digit lead out right. there. So we, need to get we to still a, got more vote to come in. All right, we need to get to a break. Uh, we invite you to stay with us. More states, more calls, plus our panel and the man who helped orchestrate Bill Clinton's campaign to win the White House, James Carville, will join us. Decision Night in America continues right here on NBC. Decision Night in America is sponsored by Amazon Echo. Welcome back. Democracy Plaza here on this election night, decision night in America. Just to keep in mind, we're about 15 minutes away from 8 o'clock Eastern, and we'll see a slew of poll closing, 16 states plus the District of Columbia. We're back now from our election center, and joining our panel is a guy who knows what it's like to help a Clinton win the White House, James Carville. Hey, James. Hi. All right. Yeah, we're a little nervous tonight, but, yeah. you know, feeling well, good. Well, read into me. Where, where are the Clinton nerves right now? Is They're looking at the same yeah. data we're looking well, at. I, I do know this. At that. Turnout in Broward, Fort Lauderdale, and Dade, Miami, City of Philadelphia are all eye popping. Now, what I don't know is what the turnout is in Trump areas, but I do know the turnout in the Clinton areas. Uh, Johnson County, Iowa, Iowa City is is just you know, like off the charts. Boulder, Colorado, the college towns. I think the story at the end of this night, if I guess, is going to be the Clinton ground game, the logistical thing that they put together, and the amount of money that they did. These numbers are are beyond anything like I think Chuck or I and you know none of us in the Cold Is that an Obama gift right now? I, that lot, gift? Yeah, a lot of people it was a Trump gift too. He probably had well, something to do with it but too. James, but James, let me ask you this. It's uh, funny you bring this up. So yes, she's gonna, but she ran against somebody who had no ground game. Right. Who did I understand. Nothing. So let me ask you, what, what would have happened if she had run against somebody with a ground game? Is this a very different? Though, you see what I mean? Is this a very I, yeah, different I, I don't election know. or not? In, in, you know, when, when political scientists go study this, we'll be able to ascertain what a ground game means because we're right. He had not. Right. Right. I mean, they have. You know, hundreds of thousands of people. I think they said they had three million touches on Saturday alone. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you know, and this is at some extent you got to say this is democracy at work. This is people out knocking on doors, people standing in line, people bringing pizzas. I mean, it, 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 there's something kind of, at some level, something American about this. James, if it works out the way that you hope that, it will, right. that she gets the presidency, right. the country is still badly fractured. Absolutely. But and and she's known factor. Everybody knows about right. her. And on the other side. They don't like her very much. They're already talking about a target-rich opportunity in the Congress <laughs> right. of the United States. So what does she do right away if, if she wins? We don't well, uh, the one thing is, is, once she gets in office, she becomes much more popular. She's a much more popular office holder than she is candidate. Uh, I, think, I think that what she's got to do is acknowledge the fact that all of these Trump voters, the people, they have something to say. They want to be heard. And I think she's got to, and I think a lot of Democrats say, you know, these people are really hurting. They're trying to say something. We, you know, she should reach out and, and say, to, you know, you were sending me a message, and I heard that message, and you came out, and 
when I say we're stronger together, I hope she says when I say together, I mean everybody. I'm not, mm. you know, I don't mean just the people that voted for me. Should she go to some red states and listen? I think so. I don't, you know, I think, I, 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 I actually do. I think it, but before she's inaugurated, I, I, I'd love to see her go to some parts of heavily Trump areas and sit she and talk to people. She can Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. No, I mean, I, but, but no. I actually mean it. I think no, that's I, a good place to start. A, look, it's not a, a, a bad idea. And I, I, there are a lot of places that she can go, but I, I do think that there are a lot of Democrats that are like, these are our people. The, to a large extent, this is why a lot of us became Democrats. Yeah. And, you know, yes, I, we want to win the election and we have a, a great coalition, but, you know, these people are, they, they're screaming that they want to be heard about something. And I think, you know, I, I, my guess is, is that she gets it. I just, I, I really believe that. What are your thoughts on the Comey factor? The polls didn't really detect anything, but when you get to this notion of Republicans coming home, there was had a 10-day stretch there where all the bad news was pointed in her direction. Right. It, it, it was, but I mean, politics with us has become so tribal that you know people have become so hardened by it. But, but I, I was very glad on Sunday when I was talking to somebody on the phone and said, "Oh my God, look what just happened." Uh, you know, I, I, it's one of these things that we, we're just going to have to ascertain later. It, it had a, uh, Robbie Mook, our campaign manager, told me that it, it really helped fundraising a lot, and they had started to see some declines before that. It, it You know, you don't know, but it might have motivated a lot of Democrats. Can I, can I think, you, you know what? You just don't know did, that for sure. I, I think you're right. I think we have to unpack this after the election. But what it did that is immeasurable is it changed Donald Trump. And, and you can't tabulate that effect. He became he focused. He became focused. It was described yeah. by, by, by sources close to him that it was like a thunderbolt, that it struck him for the first time in, in, in many weeks or several weeks that he could actually win this thing. So he gave up his Twitter. He read from a <laughs> teleprompter. He did all that boring stuff that I talked about a couple of minutes ago. So you can never, I mean, I mean, I, I think the polls are hard to decipher because because this was a time in elections when, when, when each party goes home to their tribes, as you said. Yeah. But, but you can never measure what the effect is of Donald Trump being disciplined for 10 straight days. Well, by the way, every time he was disciplined for 10 straight days, there was a coincide, coinciding right. rise in the polls. Exactly. Yeah, you know, but, you know, he can be disciplined for 10 days, but the, the stuff he did on his announcement day, the stuff that he did, he did again, that gets baked in the cake, and that makes impressions that last on people. I, you know, it, 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 10 days of discipline, you know, going to help it, some. But James, I'm curious, what does Bill Clinton think of losing the Bubba vote. I say this because yeah, you know what? Bill I, Clinton's map I, in tw 1992, yeah. uh, these were his people. I, 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 very people. I am very reluctant to, to talk about conversations I have with President Clinton, but he does not happy about it at all. I, 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 can, I can assure you that it is a topic that, that gnaws on him. and, and he, his people it, in Arkansas. Right, He's in some, the people in, he grew up with. Right. And some Democrats say that, look, our coalition is growing. That coalition is shrinking, which is demonstrably true. But there are a lot of people in a Democratic coalition that say, you know, these were. I'm going to interrupt people. you because so. we've, we've, we've got a call here in South Carolina. NBC News projects when the votes are in, Donald Trump wins South Carolina. Chuck? Not a huge surprise. It is the one state, though, in the southeast corner down there that hasn't moved into battleground territory. But I can tell you there are a bunch of Democrats there that think right. with time it could. Let's look at the, uh, we can go down to the map there and look at where we think stand now in the electoral count. There it is, the race to 270. 33 for Trump, 3 for Clinton. The night is still early. The map barely filled in. <laughs> But there you have it right now. Uh, Play the threes right now in the, uh, <laughs> uh, on your lotto numbers right now and see if it hits before eight. We're not encouraging that behavior. Oh. We want to point that out. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're staying with us. We're just minutes away from those 8 p.m. poll closings. A big moment rapidly approaching. Our Decision Night in America coverage continues right here on NBC. The plot is about to thicken seven and a half minutes until polls close in 16 states plus the District of Columbia. We've got some big ones here. Florida, Pennsylvania on there. This is where my friend Chuck Todd begins to salivate now as he looks at his at his map. Tell me about it what you're going to focus here. on. Let this me next. tell you this. It is Florida, Florida, Florida. Okay, the part that the polls are closing in, of course, is the central time zone area there. But I'll tell you this. Look, we have 71% in. Clinton's pulled a, uh, a lead in statewide. Here is your swing county of Florida. As Hillsborough goes, this is in Tampa. As Hillsborough goes, so goes the state of Florida. She's got a 10-point lead here, as you can see. Still 
Still a lot of vote to come in Hillsborough, but this is a good sign for her. Let me just quickly show you the spread in Miami-Dade. 30-point spread. This is where we are watching to see if there's an Hispanic surge for her. It certainly looks like it so far, but this is just early vote. We don't know what Election Day voting is going. If this goes to Clinton, then a lot of eyes are going to lock on Pennsylvania. It becomes he's got to win Pennsylvania and, in the next and hour Michigan. If he loses Florida, he needs Pennsylvania and Michigan. He can't just get away with winning one of them. This all comes back now to that same area of the country you're talking about as we Here move we up from Florida. This has become her power center. It really, it, it could be interesting, but it, it absolutely could. The fact that Virginia, Florida, and you heard it. I was talking to Robbie Muck earlier today, and he brought up Florida, Virginia, Pennsylvania. He said that's their backbone to 270, and they think they're going to win all three, and they think once they do, it's checkmate for Donald Trump. All right, we've got some big ones again coming up. 16 states, District of Columbia. Grab a drink, grab a snack, hurry back to the TV. Those 8 p.m. poll closings. Moments away, a lot of important states. Florida, 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 as Chuck said. Our decision night in America coverage continues here on NBC. We are back on this decision night in America. It is 8 o'clock in the East, one of the biggest moments of the night as polls have just closed in a slew of states, 16 in all, plus the District of Columbia. Let's take you through where things stand right now. Florida, we've been watching that raw vote come in. Right now, that is too close to call in Florida. Pennsylvania, another big one, battleground state, too close, uh, too early to call. Pennsylvania, too early to call. New Hampshire, too early to call. Now we've got a bunch of states here in which there are projected winners, starting with Alabama. We project that Donald Trump wins Alabama. In Connecticut, Hillary Clinton, the projected winner. Delaware will also go to Hillary Clinton. The District of Columbia to Hillary Clinton. Illinois, her home state, goes to Hillary Clinton, as well as the state of Maryland. And Massachusetts, also in the Clinton column. Mississippi, we project that Donald Trump wins in Mississippi. New Jersey to Clinton. Oklahoma, the projected winner, Donald Trump. Rhode Island, Hillary Clinton. And Tennessee, Donald Trump. Let's look at the uh, count right now, the race to 270. At this hour, based on those projections, Clinton stands with 75, Trump with 66. 66 in the race to 270. Now, a couple others we want to mention right now. We're watching uh, Maine. It is too early. Actually, we're looking at Missouri up there, but too early. Uh, Maine is uh, too early, but uh, Clinton is leading there in Mississippi. No, I'm sorry. No, that was Missouri. I'm sorry. My bad there. We, Missouri was too early. We got that straight, and Trump is leading there. And there is the map now uh, as the colors begin to fill in and on the race to 270. Savannah Guthrie is here right now. Savannah, we're also watching some big Senate races. Yeah, I, I promised you it was going to be a cliffhanger. Now the Democrats are trying to wrest control of the Senate, and they've got a pickup, meaning they've got one seat now into their corner that they need. They need four if Hillary Clinton wins. It's Tammy Duckworth, the congresswoman who is going to be the senator from Illinois. She displaces the incumbent. Mark Kirk, widely believed to be probably the most vulnerable incumbent in the Senate. Tammy Duckworth, of course, an Iraq War veteran, a wounded warrior. And Mark Kirk was one of the first Republicans to really distance himself from Trump. He did so after Trump questioned uh, the impartiality of an American judge who had Mexican heritage. He was one of the first. And yet, as we've seen in so many of these Senate races, Tammy Duckworth, the Democrat in that race, really tried to tie Kirk to Trump as much as possible. It's a deep blue state. It's the president's home state, so it's not a big shocker. But if you're keeping score at home, and we hope you are, the Democrats have netted one. All right, let's bring in now uh, our panel. James Carville remains here with us, and we welcome in our friend Hugh Hewitt, NBC News political analyst and host of the Hugh Hewitt Show on Salem Radio Network. Uh, you just heard all those calls. Where do you, where's your head at right now? Uh, I'm very happy that Senator Rob Portman has been reelected. He ran a model campaign, a responsible campaign built on civility, but also hard-nosed politics of the sort that James did when he first won a state race in Pennsylvania. He also educated the country about the opioid epidemic, which takes more lives in Ohio every day. 
day than in car crashes do. I just love the fact he's going back. We've got good signs out of Indiana for Todd Young, and that would mean two new war veterans in the Senate. Senator-elect Duckworth and Senator-elect Todd Young would both be uh, combat uh, veterans, and I think that would it's be a good thing. It's important you brought that up because we had lost a whole bunch of Vietnam vets. We had sort of a gap with very little military service in Don't the Senate. Don't forget Jason Cander no, in Missouri, you, definitely that's right. in it. Tom Cotton was sort of the first one of these to Dan get uh, uh, Gen and, and Dan Sullivan, and now we're, we're starting to see that new generation, Tom. Well, and, and the fact is that this generation I've been very impressed with because they've come back and they say we want to be involved in public life. They're doing it not just by running for office, but they've got all kinds of foundations going on. They're running off to South America and to Africa, getting projects going there because they're mission oriented. They were trained so well in the military and they came back and they wanted to use the skills that they were trained with there. And my own hope is that we can expand that for young people. That's the same kind of military training that they get, you can do in public service in other ways as well, and give them something to shoot for. The millennials are going to be the fastest growing most educated, most entrepreneurial generation we've ever had in this country, and we don't want them on the outside looking in. We've got to get them into the system in well, some way. All right, I want to bring in, uh, actually, if I just interrupt, so I want to bring in Kellyanne Conway, campaign manager for Donald Trump. She joins us from Trump Tower. Mm -hmm. Kellyanne, great to see you. Hi, Lester. Uh, tell me what it's like now. You have done everything you can do. Now you, like the rest of the country, are waiting. What is it like? What are you seeing in the numbers so far? Well, it's high energy here. I just uh, was with Mr. Trump on my way down here. He's watching the returns, and we have a whole digital and data war room, not atypical, where we're getting many different inputs from all across the country and trying to piece together our 270. We feel really good about the fact that we've kept this race very competitive with a political veteran who has many advantages and a ton more money than we do. Uh, and I just think that the movement that Donald Trump has built has been able to grow the party in a very different way, be more pro-worker, a little less elitist, and frankly, uh, you know, a party that really represents change and not the status quo. We haven't already, we haven't always been able to claim that mantle. I, I know you folks have said that Florida is a must win. Let's put up, if we can put up the, uh, the Florida numbers and show you where they are. I mean, right now we have it as too close to call, but, but Clinton uh, uh, with a 49-48 lead there. What are you seeing in those numbers? Does it worry you? Is there a path without Florida? We have seen the same thing in our internal polling for weeks, if not months, in Florida, uh, Lester, in that we never had Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton at 50 percent in any of our polls, and you see tonight that's actually happening. And it, ironically, it's not because the, down, the other party candidates were growing their electoral vote. They weren't. Their vote share was actually shrinking in the case of a Jill Stein or a Gary Johnson in most states. It's really just how divided the country and these states are. And, I, you know, Florida's always... A very tight. Even in, in the year 2000, it all came down to Florida. And when you look back, George W. Bush had been the nominee for a couple of years. They had cleared the field for him. He had the entire Republican infrastructure behind him, all the elected officials. His brother was the governor of the state, and he won by 527 votes and went all the way to the Supreme Court. So let's remind ourselves how tight of a contest Florida always is. We're hopeful, though, as the panhandle closes. They, of course, vote a whole extra hour because they're an hour behind time zone-wise that um, we'll be able to catch up with her. Hillary Clinton banked a big early vote in Florida, and uh, but we saw that we Mitt Romney was losing the early vote in Florida by about 167,000 votes or so. We cut that number almost in half to about 88,000. Do you envy her ground uh, so game? So we're hoping for a big day of. Pardon? Do you envy her ground game? I don't envy much about her, but uh, I would say that they've got a very sophisticated ground game. She's basically been running uh, for president for eight years, I mean, since she lost the, the last time. And it's a very sophisticated operation. I mean, one can argue, Lester, she should have put us away a long time ago. If you've got that kind of ground game, you've got all the money, all the king's horses, all the king's men, all, all the support, a current sitting president who's incredibly popular and a first lady who's incredibly popular, a former president that's popular who just happens to be your husband, lots of celebrities. I mean, I think the great reluctance in this campaign has been of people to actually go there with Hillary Clinton to say, if I'm one of the 70 percent of Americans who wants change, who wants to take the country in a new and different direction, how can I vote for Hillary Clinton? That, there's been a great reluctance. Kellyanne, I'm just going to stop you just for a second. We do have a call in the Senate race. Uh, Rubio win. Marco Rubio will, is the projected winner in Florida. What do you take from that? I think that's terrific. He's been a great senator, and uh, Florida's lucky to have him, and he would work very well with the President Donald Trump. Um, so I'm glad he got back in the race, and I'm, I'm very happy that Floridians put him over the top.
Hey, Kellyanne, uh, this is Chuck. It is interesting. I've been watching this all night to see what the performance was be with, between Donald Trump and Marco Rubio in Florida. And he's basically overperforming you by about three points, uh, a good 150,000 votes more that he's got than Donald Trump. Was Rubio a help to you? Is this a case where you're, you're, you're right now, if you win this, Rubio help, uh, uh, help pull you across the finish line in Florida? Or, or how do you read it? Well, it's a great ticket to have Trump and Rubio on the same ticket. I think it tells people that there are two people who want to add, improve upon Obamacare. There are two people who want to defeat radical Islamic terrorism, who want to create growth, economic growth, and more jobs. And uh, they're very similar in many ways, certainly policy-wise. So we would hope you know, perhaps he can help us. I, I do, I, back to an earlier point, though, Chuck, too, there are some Senate races, and particularly governor races tonight, where we're running ahead of those candidates in their states. There hasn't been a lot of talk about that. There's, there's talk about the reverse many times. But in the four states that have governor's races, in the last polls, we were ahead of those Republican gubernatorial candidates. So we like to think that we're helping some of those as well. All right. Kellyanne, great to have you on. Thanks very much for Thank joining you. us. Good to talk to you. Uh, Katie Turr is at Trump headquarters here in New York. Katie, what do you have? Hey there, Lester. I just spoke with the GOP source in Ohio, a high-level source who tells me that they believe it is going to go down to the wire in Ohio. But they do have a bit of good news. They believe that Donald Trump didn't come in uh, with such a deficit in the way that Romney did in early voting. And they believe that he could potentially make um, some good numbers up in two counties, in West Ohio and in Mahoning County. Uh, the Clinton team, on the other hand, is also feeling quite good about that state. Uh, it's a state to remember that Donald Trump visited 26 times, the state that he was leading with many poll in many of the polls to state that they started to feel very confident in but now the Clinton campaign is saying that they are feeling pretty confident as well they're optimistic they're saying that no one wins in Ohio without putting in the work without a ground game now I spoke to my GOP source and asked them uh, what sort of ground game did Donald Trump have in addition to the RNC you remember the Trump campaign had been heavily relying on the RNC's ground game effort and that source said I have no idea uh, again, this is a race that is very, very, very close, and that GOP source believes that it could go so late into the night that potentially they won't be able to make a call tonight, maybe well into tomorrow as well. Lester? All right, and, and, and right now we have it down as too close to call. Katie Turr, thanks very much. Uh, Hugh Hewitt, uh, talk about, if you, if you can, Republicans coming home. You were one of them. Yeah. That, that a few <laughs> weeks ago you were calling for Donald Trump to uh, leave the race. What transpired down, down well, the stretch? Well, he didn't. I wanted him to, I wanted to withdraw, and I think Mike Pence would have won easily tonight, but he didn't, so I voted for him, and he's run a... Uh, I'm actually kind of amazed to sit here and see Donald Trump racking up uh, states on the Electoral College map that go down in history. I never thought he had a prayer of getting the nomination. I never thought we would be talking about this tonight. He changed the issue set in the race, uh, but he is running behind the senators, and I, I want to go back to that. It, it's significant where there are... Portman is, is a lot ahead of him in Ohio, and Rubio is called, and he put Florida away, and, uh, and Todd Young is probably doing better in Indiana. Mike, that's Mike Pence. If Dr. Joe Heck gets the same bump over uh, Donald Trump in Nevada that Rubio got over Donald Trump, Joe Heck could be the next senator, Dr. General Joe Heck in Nevada. You know, it, I'm just going to say, interestingly enough, Rob Portman thought at the beginning that Trump would help him down in that corner of uh, Ohio yep. where it's Appalachia, where it comes together with West Virginia and Kentucky. In the end, then Portman was helping pull Trump. By the way, consider Ohio. this, guys. There, there may be a presidential, somebody who ran for the presidential nomination on the Republican side who will, we know will be giving a victory speech tonight. Yeah. And that's Marco Rubio. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Maybe the only one yeah. who ran for oh, no, president no, no. this cycle. And he may have saved the Senate by getting back into the race as well. He may have saved the Senate for the Republican. Little, little Marco, as he was called, by, by the man who was at the top of the ticket. And, and it's so a sweet revenge for him. By the way, President Obama went yeah. to Florida and shamed Marco Rubio by name, saying, how do you call someone in the primary a con artist and then say you're supporting him? And I think the direct quote from the president was, come on, man. But yet, Marco Rubio prevails. And as Chuck was asking Kellyanne Conway, will he have some coattails for Donald Trump at the top of the ticket. I think the right. important thing is in terms of the presidential race thus far we've seen nothing surprising or nothing significant in our projections. Yeah. I think that's yeah. going to change in an hour. I'd, I'd, I'd advise people to stick <laughs> around because it'll be a little bit different an hour from now. But right now everything that we've seen is, is not surprising and imminently predictable. All it? right. Stay with us. A lot going on. We're going to check in on some key presidential battleground states including some very interesting exit polls. You'll want to see our Decision Night in America coverage continues here on NBC.
Outside view of the crowd gathering on Democracy Plaza on this big, big night. Hallie Jackson in the newsroom here. She and her team continuing to dig through the exit polling. Hallie, what's the latest on what you have? What insight can you Lester, share? Here's what we know, that no matter who ends up the president-elect of the United States tomorrow morning, about half of Americans are going to wake up with really deep concerns about that candidate. And that is actually what we're seeing driving voters to the polls. Take a look. People who voted for Hillary Clinton, 20% of them voted for her because they didn't like Donald Trump. That's twice what we saw back in 2012. Same goes, and even more extreme, for Donald Trump voters. Nearly 30% of them voted for Donald Trump because they didn't like Hillary Clinton. That's three times what we saw in 2012. So I, could, I think you could call this the nose holders vote, if you will. Somebody sort of casting their ballot, but holding their nose and doing it. I want to talk about a couple of really key swing states we've been talking about all night. The first one, Florida. And here's the breakdown so far. Remember, these are the early exit polls of Hispanic voters. You can see they are breaking more for Hillary Clinton. She is outperforming where Barack Obama was back in 2012. Donald Trump underperforming where Mitt Romney was. Last, I want to take a peek at Ohio and specifically union voters. What we are seeing from these early exits is that Donald Trump message on trade, on the economy seems to be resonating. And we see that here. Back in 2012, more union households voted for the Democrat, but Donald Trump has reversed that trend in Ohio. He actually is appealing to more union voters, about half of them. He's outperforming Hillary Clinton by six percentage points there. Interesting stuff, given that Donald Trump's message throughout much of this campaign was aimed at working class voters. Lester? All right. We're going to get right out now to the uh, campaign headquarters, NBC's Kristen Welker, at the Hillary uh, Clinton headquarters of the Jacob Javits Center here in New York. Kristen? Lester, good evening. Secretary Clinton fighting to make history tonight. She's watching returns with her family at a hotel here in New York. Her top campaign officials telling me they are feeling confident heading into tonight, feeling good about a robust ground game that they have built up. One official telling me they've knocked on two million doors today alone. They also feel good about the way that Secretary Clinton ended this race. One official saying she ended it on the exact note that she was hoping to, arguing that she will be a unifying force if she is elected and talking about why she will be the most qualified president despite all of the divisive rhetoric and of course that email controversy which dogged her until the very end. Now the states that they're watching closely, Michigan, that reliably blue state where Donald Trump has been making a serious play, North Carolina and of course Florida. She's preparing two speeches tonight but hoping she'll deliver a victory speech. Lester. All right, Kristen, Peter Alexander is at the Trump headquarters of the Hilton down the block from us here in New York. What are you seeing there, Peter? Lester, good evening to you. I just spoke to a top source close to Donald Trump who tells me they're feeling very good right now, touting what he describes as epic numbers, the turnout specifically in some white Republican counties in states like Michigan and New Hampshire right now. This source close to Donald Trump is now predicting victories in states like Ohio, Iowa, North Carolina, New Hampshire, and the second district of Maine gives you a sense of the real confidence they have right now. They also look at the lower than normal African American turnout in places like Michigan and North Carolina that they think will have a benefit. But the bottom line, the source says right now, is I'm going to be realistic. You've got to be lucky, but this race is certainly going to be a lot closer than most Americans may have thought. Lester? All right, Peter, thanks very much. Chuck ran over to the map here. What is it? I did because, uh, look, the turnout, the fact is, everybody has higher turnout. And I'm going to give you an example of how Trump territory is turning out in much bigger numbers. I want to tell you the story here in Florida of a Hernando County, okay? It's right up here. Mitt Romney won this county by eight points. And you see here the total vote over there. I'm going to show you here the total vote here, as you can see, you know, about 87,000 uh, total on this. Now, let me take you to 2016 and our map here, and I'm going to show you Hernando now. All the vote is not in. Trump is winning it by a whopping 29 points, and there is more vote. That's good news. That is a big deal. But let me take you he's to Miami. He's finding a base there, yeah. That's right. So he's increased the number overall, and he's getting 30% more of about 10,000 new voters. Now let me take you to Miami-Dade. 80% in. There's still 20% of the vote. Let's quickly add this up. You've got over, not, you've got basically a million votes right now in Miami-Dade. They didn't top 800, they didn't top 900,000 during Barack Obama. She's winning by 30 points. Barack Obama won it by 24. The point is, good news for both of them. Their bases are up. She is winning bigger 
among more voters, he is winning big among a smaller group of new voters. And our obsession with Florida on election night continues. And there it is. It shows you. Hernando, good news for Trump. Miami, great news for All Trump. All right, we need to get to a break. We're going to take a quick break, but we have a lot more of our coverage. The race to 270 electoral votes well underway. Our decision night in America coverage continues here on NBC. Closings in another seven and a half minutes or so. As we uh, look at the map there on uh, uh, Arkansas, will be the next poll closing as we look at the map there. And uh, I want to talk briefly, if I can, Savannah and Chuck, about every four years we're confronted with the way we elect presidents, <laughs> this electoral college, the 270 number. Florida, of course, really put it in our face. Um, and we always visit the idea, why do we do it that way? Well, because the Constitution says so, but that doesn't make it any less odd. And I think for a lot of people watching this election and watching shows like ours, they're always hearing about national polls. Well, that's not how we elect a president in this country. As we learned distinctly in 2000, you could win the popular vote, but not win the Electoral College. So basically, our founders set it up that each state has a certain amount of electoral votes. It's based on population, and you've got to reach that magic number of 200. Which is why you may not have seen any of these candidates that's come to your state. It is, but I can I tell you, there's a bug in this system. Number one, when you have an even number of electors, you can end in a tie. It is way too easy to end in a tie, and that is ridiculous to create a constitutional crisis under that Lester, scenario. Lester, don't get no. Chuck started on the electoral college. But I'll college. tell you, I used to be a big defender of it. And then I will tell you this, go explain it to somebody overseas, and when you no longer, the great American democracy, and you can't tell them it's one person, one vote, it's like, well, it's, let me, and you're just like, by the time you're explaining, you're going, what have I done? It is very difficult. When, when it's difficult to explain your own voting system to somebody overseas, maybe you need a new one. But it's the playing field we have. Look, it may not be the system we want, but it's the system we got, and that's what we're going to have tonight, that's and right. we're going to go through with it. No. That's how we roll, as they right. say. Stay with us. Polls are about to close in the state of Arkansas, where Bill Clinton served as governor before winning the White House himself. We'll have that and more on our Decision Night in America coverage right here on NBC. And this is control of the House of Representatives. NBC News projects that Republicans will retain control of the House of Representatives. Now, let's quickly take you outside where we've got a call from the state of Arkansas. And as we move up the building, NBC News projects that Donald Trump will win in the state of Arkansas. Of course, the state that Hillary Clinton was for many, many years, the first lady. We're back with our panel right now. And, uh, Chuck, you're going over your... your I am. Here. Nicole and I... He's look, geeking out. Can I interrupt yeah. just a moment? Tell was Florida, Florida, PTSD. Florida, well, first of all, that's right. Don't forget, she worked in Florida before she worked for President Bush. Um, uh, that's right, you know, back in, the, back in the day when we were both young bucks. Um, we were just both sitting there, what's out in Florida? 91% in. I think Trump's leading by about 60,000 votes. And we're both noting, like, why is the Clinton campaign feeling good and the Trump campaigning not so good? It's because of what's remaining, what's out. Right. We were just looking. I mean, Gainesville still hasn't come in. That's a college town. You still got a lot, almost half of the Broward vote hasn't come half in. Half of Palm Beach. Uh, half of Palm Beach and, a, and still about 15% of Miami-Dade. And as we showed you, she's winning Miami-Dade by numbers that are landslide-like for Miami-Dade. And why do we care so much about Florida? Because for Trump, <laughs> it's right. it's a, as close to a must-win as there is. It's not that he can't put together 270 votes without Florida, but it becomes uh, exceedingly difficult. For me, it's deja vu. Yeah. <laughs> 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 You're sitting there. Wait, you can't see. Look at Tom. He's going, I can't what are you talking right about? <laughs> You've seen this movie. <laughs> so Florida, Florida, Florida. Yeah. I mean, at one point, I had Bill Daly in one ear, and I had Carl Rove in the other ear on the phone saying, what's going on? I said, if you don't know, how do I know? <laughs> <laughs> Back in 2000, of course. Florida, Florida, Florida. I mean, the late Here Tim we Russert, again. we miss some nights like yeah. this. We, but we, it was we, we could be. <laughs> but, but the bigger story is both that both bases came out. You know, the fact is everything came out 
It just may be she has a bigger base. And, and, yeah. just, and just a record keep now, Ohio is too close to call, Florida uh, too close to call, Pennsylvania too early to call. So those are big ones hanging out there right now. Uh, we want to go to Andrea Mitchell. She's at Hillary Clinton headquarters here in New York. Are they, are they feeding into any of this? Are they watching these numbers the way we are? Oh, you can imagine how much they are watching it, their boiler room, their war room, looking at it. And over at the Peninsula Hotel, only a few blocks from here, both Clintons have now weighed in on the speech that they hope they'll be delivering. Two versions, as we said. One is a victory speech. And so the speechwriters were in, in the hotel with both Bill and Hillary Clinton. Imagine having both of those principals editing your speech. And now uh, the speechwriters are going back to work, making some changes. So we've all been edited by our editors and producers, but that's a pretty high-powered team of Bill and Hillary Clinton editing. The other thing to report is that my Democratic sources, this is not campaign sources, these are Democratic Party sources in Michigan telling me they're getting a little nervous in Michigan because the uh, Democratic areas of Detroit and Flint are not showing the kind of vote that they had wanted to see. It's obviously early, but it's raining. They're a little worried about this. Michigan could be very tight, as you know, both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were there only yesterday. And it would be far more important for Donald Trump's path. His, he really wants to flip a blue state. Not critical for Clinton, but they would still like to win Michigan. They lost it, as you know, in a surprising upset by Bernie Sanders. The trade issue is a big factor there against Clinton and for Trump. Lester? All right, Andrea, thanks very much. Joining us now from Clinton headquarters is former Michigan Governor Jennifer Granholm. Governor, good to have you on. Thanks so much. So great to be on. Thanks so much. I watched you on uh, MSNBC earlier today, and you couldn't wipe a smile off your face. To, uh, I know. Give it's me democracy. The, give me the I mean, really. But that was earlier. Now that you're starting to see some raw vote totals come in yeah. and watching what we're watching in Florida, how is your level and the campaign's level of confidence right now? I think we feel really good because, as Chuck was saying, there are still a huge sectors of the electorate that have not come in, and a lot of that is our, our, our people, whether it's Broward County or, you know, in Michigan. As you know, in many of these states that we count on, a lot of the urban areas come in later than the rural areas, and so we are feeling really good still. All right. Now, We've, we've talked about Florida being a, a must win. That's according to the Trump folks. But without right. it, he made you defend. He made you defend Pennsylvania. Look where the the Clinton camp campaign ended yesterday. How do you feel about Pennsylvania? Good about Pennsylvania. In fact, we think between Pennsylvania and Virginia and North Carolina. I mean, I think you know again. It's still early. You got to see the rest come in, but we're feeling really good about the ground game that we have mustered, what we're hearing on the ground anecdotally and what we're seeing in the numbers. We know what's out there. So, everybody just take everybody on my side. Take a deep breath. It's going to be okay. And by the way, can we not all just celebrate that it's record turnout in democracy? But, People really love this country and care about it. But, but come on, something's got to be making you nervous right now. What is it? <laughs> well, I mean, Michigan always makes me nervous because that's go. my that's my you know that's my state. And I, I am concerned about the numbers in Detroit and Flint, but I do know that a lot of that is made up for by the very large, for example, Arab American community that's in Michigan, in Dearborn. We know that President Clinton actually visited, and there's huge turnout in that community. So if there is a diminution in votes in Detroit, We've made up for it, I think, with the votes in the Arab American community, the Latino community, and frankly, we had banked uh, 50,000 of the absentee votes. So we still, I mean, it's still close. It's closer than anybody wants it to see me, but I feel very good about Michigan anyway. Still makes me nervous, though. All right, Governor, <laughs> always good to talk to you. Until it's in. Thank yeah, you so much for joining us. Uh, Savannah, Thanks. you've got a Senate call here. We do. State of Indiana, deep red, and it's a Republican hold for the Senate. We have Congressman Young, Todd Young, going to the Senate. Evan Bai, whose name you probably recognize, a former senator from Indiana, was vying to get his seat back. What an interesting story, because this is a, a case where it's really not expected to be a battleground. For a moment, it seemed it might be, because the strength of Evan Bai's connection to the state of Indiana, a lot of Democrats 
Democrats were excited. Hey, maybe we can make Somehow this Somehow he got painted as an outsider. Well, no, no. He, too much of an insider. Too Way too insider. much of an insider. Somebody who had lost his Indiana roots. Somebody who barely had an address anymore in Indiana. He could remember the correct, I think he got a court and avenue confused of his Indiana address. Yeah, so he had these deep Indiana roots and yet it wasn't enough and so we see that Indiana holds. That's, that's a red state, stays that way. Doesn't alter our ultimate Senate math. We still just have one Democratic pickup on the record, I believe, so far. But one of the races we were closely watching because it had the potential to be competitive. All right. The interesting thing about uh, Young Bai is that he got whipsawed by his prior job. He was working for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Then they came out against him. He'd been away for a while, and he kind of assumed that he was going to go back. He's a Democrat that from another era. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, a centrist yeah. Democrat that just didn't fit this Democratic Party. Right. He thought, oh, look, Donald Trump's unpopular. Maybe I can sneak back into the Senate. Yeah. Never nope. forget, when he left the Senate, he penned this op-ed. Remember, you and I were covering the White House then, and he said, I don't love Congress. I think there are better <laughs> ways to serve. And yet here <laughs> we are, 2016, yeah. he was trying to get back in, but no dice. No dice. And you, you mentioned um, Karl Rove. I mean, this is sort of Don Rumsfeld's known unknowns. It's a known unknown how the top of the ticket's going to turn out. But Republicans, I'm hearing from all over the country, feeling very cheered by this Senate seat and very cheered by what they're seeing with Marco Rubio and other down-ballot races. Hallie Jackson has another look at exit polling, specifically what women voters are saying. Hallie, that's something we continue to focus on in this race. And Lester, we started talking about it, if you can believe it, a year and three months ago at that very first primary debate for Republicans when the first question to Donald Trump was about his comments about women. Here we are on election night and take a look at what our early exit polls are telling us. That 51 percent of voters across the country are bothered a lot by Donald Trump's treatment of women. And so watch what happens to this purple section of the pie here when we dive into how this breaks out. Of those voters who say they were bothered a lot, look at how it breaks down. Eight in 10 say they voted for Hillary Clinton over Donald Trump. Not particularly surprising when you look at the fact that they say they're bothered by women, but it is certainly notable that Hillary Clinton made her closing argument, at least part of it, on Trump's treatment of women. And for these voters, Lester, that is something that has resonated. And, and I want to continue on what you're talking about there. Kate Snow joins us now from King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, where she's been talking with women voters. Kate? Hi, Lester. Here's the thing. We're in what's called the collar counties outside of Philadelphia, the suburban counties outside of Philly. And these counties, since 1976, have really predicted the way the state of Pennsylvania will, will go. So that's why we're here. We got a lot of Trump supporters here and behind me, but I wanted to talk to a few women over here who are actually all Hillary Clinton supporters, if I can just uh, barge in for a second. So, Jennifer, you were telling me that you voted Republican up until recently, but today you voted for Hillary Clinton. Oh, definitely. And why? Because she's knowledgeable. She's the most qualified candidate running for office, and she I agree with a lot of the things that she stands for. We were just talking about the exit polling, and a lot of it is showing that women, many women were turned off by Donald Trump. Is, is that part of what, what motivated your vote? Definitely. I think that the derogatory things that he said in, to the media have been, like, repulsive. And also, um, reproductive rights are important to me. So. Sheila and Vicky are both wearing lace and white on purpose. What's what, what's that about, Sheila? Um, it's a call out to the suffragettes who um, called for the original women's votes, and it's such a historic day having a female candidate for a major party. So we wanted to kind of recognize that. And if she wins tonight, you told me you're in your 30s, yes. right? You guys are millennials. Yeah. What what does that mean for you if Hillary Clinton pulls this off? Um, it's just such an important event that I will be so impressed if she wins and so happy because of what I value. And she really, you know, epitomizes that and can speak well in that. And it's just an incredible candidate. Thank you guys so much for sharing a little bit. Appreciate it. You know, Lester, the thing is, as I said, these counties really can be important in the way that Pennsylvania goes. We're checking in with all of the offices here. In terms of these four counties, turnout does seem to be pretty high, according to both the Democrats that I've talked to and the Republicans that I've talked to. They're talking about long lines. Uh, I just talked to the Delaware County chair of the Democratic Party who thinks that they're going to be counting votes here for a long time after the official poll closing. So polls closed here at 8 o'clock, but they think there are people still in line, Lester, and they may be at it until late, late tonight. Yeah, Actually. we suspect so. Uh, Kate Snow, thanks. And again, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, we have it in our column as uh, too early to call. We're going to take another quick break. When we come back, we're going to check in with more of our correspondents fanned out across America in key battleground states, what they're seeing and what they're hearing on the ground when our Decision Night in America coverage continues here on NBC.
Decision Night in America is sponsored by Amazon Echo. Get real-time election results throughout the night by asking your Amazon Echo, Alexa, who's ahead in Iowa or any other state? And be sure to enable the NBC News skill for the latest headlines. As we come back uh, to our election center from a break, you're watching Senator Marco Rubio, who has, is projected to defeat Republican uh, Patrick Murphy, uh, making comments to the crowd there with his family. And we'll continue to monitor that. Meantime, we continue to watch what's happening around battleground states across the country. And Chuck Todd has moved over to the map here. He's trying to figure out where things stand right now as we wait some of these well, big states. A little bit, but you know, we, we need to remind people here, Virginia, we moved to too close to call. Now, the numbers have been creeping up. There's still a lot of Northern Virginia vote still to go. As you know, Loudon, as Loudon goes, so goes things. So that's the good news for Clinton. But as we've told you, um, and I, I want to make sure I see if I get Campbell County here just right. Whoop, get this just right. Here we go. This was a question about whether he would do well with some evangelicals. And you look here, I mean, the numbers are big for Trump and Trump territory, too. This goes to, and, and uh, Nicole, you were sharing with me, Steve Shale, who ran Florida for um, Obama, both in 08 and 12. He said everybody's vote totals have been shattered in the state of Florida. We're going to have record turnout in the state of Florida in the red counties and in the blue counties. Now, we'll see how this balances out, but it explains why. We're seeing some of these battleground states. Virginia was something that a lot of people thought, and she's doing well in the northern Virginia, but he's doing well in Trump country. We're all waiting with bated breath for when uh, the polls close in Michigan. As you know, the Clinton folks were rushed in to defend what they thought was a sizable lead in Michigan. Kevin Tibbles is at a Trump watch party in Grand Rapids, Michigan. How are they feeling about this night? Well, people here tonight uh, have been listening to you folks, Lester, talking about how Michigan all of a sudden seems to have come into play here. Uh, people here say that in western Michigan, which is where Grand Rapids is, you're absolutely right that the Hillary Clinton campaign had to come in here yesterday. But of course, being a GOP rally here this evening, they were all out after midnight last night because Donald Trump made one of his final stops here. Grand Rapids all of a sudden is on the map with regards to this election campaign, Lester. They were also listened to the fact that, that in the Democratic areas and in around Detroit, people are now saying that the turnout was not very good. Well, here in western Michigan, which there are very strong Republican uh, pockets, like the one I'm speaking to you from, they're saying that the lines were down the street when they got there this morning. They are very sort of encouraged by what they uh, say they saw on the streets here in Michigan today, Lester. All right, let's stay in the Middle East, uh, Middle East, the Midwest. Uh, <laughs> Kevin, thanks very much. Kelly O'Donnell is at House Speaker Paul Ryan's headquarters in Janesville, Wisconsin, Midwest. Hey, Kelly. Good evening, Lester. This is unusual. House Speaker Paul Ryan is actually in the room here. He is over my left shoulder milling about with some of the guests who have come to his headquarters tonight. For Paul Ryan, this is really kind of a three-level night. His own house race, which he expects to win easily, kind of a position for the future of the party. Will he be and continue to be the highest-ranking Republican in elective office? And, of course, if Donald Trump were to win, that would put him in the second spot. And what happens next for the congressional majority? It's expected the House will hold its majority. What will happen on the Senate side? And how will Congress have a partnership with the new president, whomever that is? But it is a bit unusual, and I guess it's a sense of how uh, Paul Ryan expects his own personal night as a candidate to go, that he is here in the room greeting supporters, hugs directly behind me talking with folks who have been a part of his life here in Janesville. I'm told he will speak fairly early this evening and will reflect on his own race and not wait for the whole night to resolve itself. Uh, he'll have plenty to say about all of that in the next few days. Lester? Think about Paul Ryan and, and what his future is like, no matter how this thing yeah. shakes out tonight. Listen, nobody grappled more publicly or painfully with their endorsement of Donald Trump than Speaker Ryan. And people who were longtime Paul Ryan staffers and, and, and advisors and, and who sort of had, had come into and out of the presidential race in 12, onto the Romney ticket and remained advisors, had hoped that he would take a principled stand against a nominee that a lot of establishment Republicans thought just 
stood for everything that Paul Ryan had 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 worked for. They, he, you know, Paul Ryan is one of the architects of, of modern conservative policy making. He's an expert on the intricacies of budget making. He really has conservative solutions for education and poverty. And whatever you think of those ideas, he is one of the chief architects in sort of the conservative uh, thinkers group. So when he endorsed Donald Trump, it was a real setback to the never Trump wing of the GOP, which which at that point I think had had unrealistic aspirations for what a sitting speaker of the house could do. The truth is, he rang he has a job of being chief wrangler of cats and that GOP caucus was overwhelmingly pro Trump. So that's the reality that he's dealing with whether Trump wins or loses. And there are a lot of rumors, they're just rumors. They're there it's sort of an undercurrent an additional anxiety for all of us hand-wringing establishment Republicans that he may be um, uh, in a little bit of jeopardy in terms well, of his post. Thing about, yeah. I, I think especially the other thing about Speaker Ryan is that he has not given up his own presidential aspirations, and that had to be a conflict in his mind. Play the part of the leader of the House Republicans, try to keep that intact, but at the same time keep his eye on the far horizon, because if Trump does go down, then he's obviously going to be a front runner. If Trump wins tonight, which we still believe that he, there's a possibility that he could do that. Absolutely. Then Paul Ryan has got a handful of trouble, not just with the people who are in the House with him, but with the new president of the United States Absolutely. as well. Don't you but think he has trouble no matter who wins yes. tonight? Right. I mean, because it's a no-win proposition. It for really him at this is point. because if Trump loses, there are going to be a lot of people who look hard at Paul Ryan and other establishment Republicans saying, hey, where were you? If you had been more enthusiastic for our nominee, maybe we'd be having a different result tonight. So and this Paul Ryan yeah. maybe has the worst job in Washington. And this is the worst nightmare for him, this tightness. All right. Yeah. We are going to take a break. We got a lot coming up. In a moment, we'll take a lay of the land. Where does the map stand? Which states are still in play? Which poll closings are upcoming? Stay with us. Our Decision Night in America coverage continues here on NBC. Less than seven and a half minutes. Uh, more polls closing, uh, including Arizona, New Mexico. We'll, we'll have more on the Latino vote. I want to go downstairs right now. Uh, Jolene Kent is out on Democracy Plaza. We've got a pretty sizable crowd now who are watching our coverage and watching these numbers come in. Jolene. Hey, Lester, that's right. We are out here on Democracy Plaza, where the, the situation here is very electric. I want to take you through the crowd here and show you some of the voters. We've got a lot of Clinton voters over here. We've got some Trump supporters behind us. And what we find is about 50% of this country, 60% of this country, believe that this country will be divided when we wake up tomorrow. And so this is an area, oh, oh, no. We've got a voter here from Arkansas as well, Lester. But what we want to tell you is, yeah, let's hear it. OK. OK. So here in Democracy Plaza, a lot of action, a lot of voters coming from all over the country here. And we'll send it back to you in studio. All right, Joe Ling, thanks very much. And if you're in the neighborhood, come on down to yeah, Democ apparently. Democracy Plaza. Big TV's there. And Bring it just on. Just be careful when you walk. Um, this coming, we mentioned this uh, coming hour, uh, yeah. Arizona, New Mexico. But you're still watching Florida. Look, look I'm going to just show you really quick. Florida, less than 1%, 100,000 votes. Georgia, we still don't have a lot of vote in. But let me show you North Carolina. As you can see here, Clinton narrowly ahead, still a lot in. And, of course, Virginia, too close to call. So, Wow. The backbone states of the battleground are all too close. Hope you didn't make a dinner reservation. We're going to be here a while. We are going to be here. All right. Stay, stay with us. Yeah, breakfast. Polls, polls about to close in 14 states minutes from now. A lot of news to get to. You don't want to miss a moment. Get comfy. Our Decision Night in America coverage continues here on NBC. We are back now from our election center here at 30 Rock in New York City. It's 9 o'clock in the east, 6 in the west. Polls have just closed in 14 more states. Take a deep breath as we take you through it. NBC News projects that Hillary Clinton will win in her now home state of New York. And now we have a slew of Trump calls, starting with Texas. Trump the projected winner. Winner In Kansas, Trump wins. Louisiana, Trump is the projected winner. Nebraska, Donald Trump. We project that North Dakota will go to Donald Trump as well as South Dakota and Wyoming, all those in the Trump 
camp and let's look at the 270 now the race to 270 here's where they stand Donald Trump at 137 electoral votes Hillary Clinton with 104 based on those projections and some other places we're watching Michigan we've talked a lot about how close things are too close to call right now Arizona another important state where Clinton's uh, made some ground up too early to call Colorado too early Minnesota right now we have it listed as too close Moving over to New Mexico right now. Too early, but Clinton right now leads in New Mexico. And finally, Wisconsin, where we visited in the last half hour. Uh, uh, it's uh, too early to call. We want to take a look again now at Florida. Uh, Florida is too close to call, but look at the numbers there. Very, very close. A difference of 100 and, uh, roughly 140,000 votes. We will not call this before midnight. You think, you think Florida's going to keep I it hanging out there? I promise you that. We will not call this before midnight. Will somebody put up the Ohio board? You, you guys like, got to see this. Okay. Please put up the Ohio board because the, the margin is so ridiculously tight that it's sort of emblematic of all the battleground states right now. Look at it. How about that, Brokaw? 2,700 votes. 2,700 votes there in Ohio. Still a lot of vote out there, but with 37% reporting. But I feel that that 2,700, that tells you Virginia, which we're going to be here a while. Yeah. That tells you North Carolina. Let's look at North Carolina. That uh, one is another one. Let's look at North Carolina. All right, uh, 3,700 vote difference right there. In and that's, what, that's with three million votes out cast so far. Yeah. It's been countered. The, the bottom line is it is turnout has been shattered on both bases we've been telling you this blue counties red counties and there's the everybody's red, and there's the red and blue states as they stand right now based on the projections joining our panel is our friend eugene robinson nbc news political analyst and columnist for the washington post what do you want to say about all this uh, gee, what can you say? <laughs> point? I mean, um, uh, we're going to be up for a while. It's, it's, it's like, it, I mean, it's the, it's, we have talked so much about in the last several weeks, uh, last several months, that the polls have been relatively stable in all the this. The polls were relatively stable. And so there's no real surprise Hillary here. Clinton with a lead, but a, a slim lead, uh, and e things could break either way. And what we're seeing tonight uh, is what we've been talking about all year, how divided the country is, how um, uh, acrimonious may not be the right word, but uh, but but it's close. This election was. As we look how, at the states that uh, Trump won has so far. Um, yeah. uh, how uh, to the extent to which it, it was a base election, and now we see both bases totally mobilized. Uh, and uh, when you're talking, we, we, we say we use that word split, but you're talking about people seeing through an entirely different set of lenses. I mean, we, we, we covered the, the political conventions and we heard two just incredibly different visions of this country. You know, I had a really interesting observation coming from the Trump campaign a couple of days ago where he said, you know, it's funny. We never are in the same place, even when we're in the same state, meaning, yeah. you know, the Clinton people in Trump. And he goes, he goes, I've never been on a race where we're not fighting. There isn't one voter they're fighting over. Exactly. It was not that. They're fight, they were fighting over voters who swing between voting and not voting. There was not a... They, no. And, and that's what we're seeing here is sort of... Um, uh, uh, balanced by extreme. But that's a difference between where the traditional battleground was. I mean, it, everything you learn in politics is, okay, in the primaries you're going for the base, but in the middle it's that swing voters and we're all trying to persuade the same people. And, and it, this didn't start just with this year, but it's really about turning out your base, getting the most number of people who support you to these polls. And I mean, just to do polls 101, yes, we've seen remarkable consistency in the polls. And Chuck, back me up here. I mean, one thing that pollsters have to do is make it an educated guess about who will actually show up. And that's the X factor tonight. Well, the other, the other X factor is that, and, and we've said this all along, that the country was not deeply in love with either one of these candidates, so they were moving back and forth a lot. And especially in the last week or so, we saw Hillary Clinton way out in the polls. Then Comey makes his original announcement. She goes down. Then he makes the other announcement on Sunday. She seems to be making right, a right. comeback. They're counting on that comeback in the last 48 hours as we talk to them. And then we're seeing tonight something that looks to be very tight as we go into deeper into the hours and a lot of people thought that we would have to. So I think it's a real manifestation of how the country is saying, oh, God, it's going to be one or the other. I, you know, I'm not sure it's going to make a lot of difference to me. They have their core groups. There's no question about that. Donald Trump has very passionate supporters. So does she. But the bulk of the country is still angry. And the big, big issue for most Americans is change. Shake it up. How are we going to change this country to get it working again? And neither one of them has been able to 
deliver on that in a persuasive way. Let's go to uh, Florida right now. Kerry Sanders is in Osceola County right now, and things are very, very close there, Kerry. Oh, my God, they're really hanging on edge. I just spoke to some folks here in the room. Uh, we're at the Darren Soto election headquarters. He turns out to be projected now to be the first Puerto Rican-American elected to Congress from the state of Florida. A lot of Latins in this room have supported him. A lot of folks here from Puerto Rico who have since moved to the United States. We should point out for those who are looking at the different Hispanic groups who may have influence today, remember that Puerto Ricans are born with a U.S. passport. They come to the United States. If they decide to live here, they can register to vote. It turns out that there has been a swell of Hispanic votes in this state. It's too close, as you know, to call whether this is going to be a Donald Trump victory or a Hillary Clinton victory. But the folks that I spoke to here just a short time ago said, they are going to be crying. They will either be crying tears of happiness if Hillary Clinton wins in this state, or they'll be crying tears of sadness, they say, if Donald Trump wins. Of course, that's just a snapshot in one room in Florida, but a lot of people hanging on edge right now, as it looks like, I think we heard Chuck Todd say, it's going to be a long night before we know which way Florida's going. Yeah, Carrie, and I'm looking at the map right now, 92% in, and Chuck is at, at that map right now. Uh, where, are the, where are the remaining votes going to come well, from? Well, I'm looking here. Right now, there is still, if you're the Clinton people, you're very happy about Broward County. There still appears, right now, this is only early vote that essentially was dumped, and we expect about a, another 400,000 out of there. If she wins that by 40 points the way she's winning it here, I don't know if that quite makes up the gap. We know there is some Miami-Dade vote, not a lot. Most of this is in. This has already shattered records here. There's still another 10% of the vote out. This is already more total vote in Miami-Dade County than we saw before. Let me take you to the Hillsborough here. As you see, this is tightened up. Now it's Clinton plus six. Obama won this by a little bit more when he won it by a point. So this is something here to keep an eye on. So look. We're now, there's a chunk of vote down here in South Florida. That's good news for her. But there's sporadic vote in a lot of Trump country as well. So, look, it is, we're sitting here. It is so, you can't sit here and say for sure. Look, it's about 100 and looks like 35,000 difference right there. I think she can get 100 of it out of South Florida. Can she find another 36,000 somewhere else? We'll see. Let me take you, by the way, to Virginia. This is going to look very familiar to folks because we essentially have 68%. If you followed the Virginia governor's race or if you followed Obama Romney, we're starting to see she's closed the gap essentially as the vote totals come in. They sort of come in from north to south here. This is the big one. Fairfax County, very little vote. We still got almost something like 80% of the vote still to come in. It's going to be a big Clinton County. This is likely enough to put her over the top, but I can tell you this. We've been here before. Brokaw brought up Jim Webb to me. It took to Fairfax counted until Jim Webb was declared the victory. It took till Fairfax counted until Terry McAuliffe won the governor's race. Uh, it took till Fairfax counted till we were comfortable calling Obama over Romney. The point is, until we see some Northern Virginia vote, that is why this thing, and I tell you, Virginia now looks like it's back smack in the battleground, and those big leads um, were essentially a myth. All right, Andrew Mitchell is at Hillary Clinton's headquarters here in New York, uh, where the crowd is certainly starting to take some of this in. There's been a lot of confidence, uh, Andrew, at the Clinton camp, but uh, there's got to be some nail fingernail biting right now. No, no, absolutely right. First of all, Virginia was something they were so confident in. They've got Terry McAuliffe as the governor. They've got Tim Kaine, former governor, uh, senator, uh, as the running mate. They actually took money out of Virginia advertising. They were that solid, they thought, in Virginia. So if this is going to be close, as close as it looks as though it is going to be. Uh, that is not good news for them. Broward County is their big hope, as uh, Chuck was just saying. I was just talking to a top Clinton official here who said, just wait. You know, we were still waiting on Broward. There's more vote to come in. But Florida is obviously that close. North Carolina, they did get a break in that the county board in Durham County extended voting hours when there were some voting problems there. Uh, that's part of the research triangle where they knew that they had a solid vote to come in. So still hoping on North Carolina. Michigan making them nervous, as we've been reporting, not getting the vote that they had expected out of Detroit and Flint. This thing is getting so close, and you just showed the numbers in Ohio as well. Uh, one question that I have for all of you guys in there with all of the information at your fingertips, 
Uh, you reported Nebraska, the projection for Nebraska for Trump, and I checked. That's four out of five congressional districts. Warren Buffett made a promise to Hillary Clinton when he endorsed her. He said, I am going to deliver Omaha because Nebraska is like Maine, where those two congressional districts are counted separately. He said he was going to go door to door today in Omaha, turning out the vote. So I want to know what happened in Omaha. Is it going Clinton or is it too close to call? Andrew, as you were speaking, we were running uh, some of the numbers. Can, can we go back to Michigan? Because I'm not sure I saw it correctly. Was that a it was double digit difference here? Where, where, Maybe at one, where we at? Yeah, Port 71. 71 difference, and that's 12% wow. in. Um, 16 electoral <laughs> votes at stake in Michigan. The Trump folks forcing the Clinton folks to try to defend Michigan, and it looks like that's going to provide a fair amount of drama. And look at, before Katie Turr, I'm going to go to you, but I want to bring up Ohio as well, because Katie was on here about an hour or so ago saying, look, the word is Ohio is going to be crazy close, and, and, and that's what it appears to be right now. Trump, though, uh, with a lead, but the difference, 162,000. Katie has been covering the, the Trump campaign from the very start and joins us now. Uh, what's the feeling? in the room. Well, the feeling in the room is obviously very exciting, as you can see behind me. The feeling uh, at Trump headquarters and Trump Tower is very upbeat. They believe the longer that this night draws out, uh, the better it is for them. You're talking about a few states that they've been paying close attention to. Virginia, interestingly, for it to be close, that is quite interesting because the Trump campaign basically pulled out their efforts uh, about three weeks ago, and if you can hear me better now with the stick mic, uh, pulled out their efforts from Virginia three weeks ago. So if it's close there, they're certainly going to feel good about that. Ohio is the state that they put a lot of focus on. As you mentioned, the GOP believes it's going to be down to the wire in Ohio, potentially a state that they won't be able to call until tomorrow. Uh, but also Michigan, that's the state that the Trump campaign is really looking to after they get to their core four. That's Florida, North Carolina, Ohio, and Iowa. If they lock those up, they're going to look towards Michigan. Michigan. It's a state that they've been to 13 times since the convention, three times in this last weekend alone. It's where Donald Trump essentially ended his campaign. He took the stage there at 12.30 this morning to a packed room of thousands of people that were still streaming in as Donald Trump arrived. He left a little bit after one. Uh, they believe that his jobs message is really going to cut across all demographics in Michigan. They believe uh, also that the African-American vote is not going to turn out for Hillary Clinton in the same way that it turned out for Barack Obama. And they're saying to me that they've seen record turnout in a couple towns in GOP counties. They're pointing that to that as a very good sign. They also are believing uh, that there is flat turnout in Flint, Michigan. So the camp, the Trump camp, is feeling quite upbeat now. They're cautiously, cautiously optimistic, but they do feel like they have a chance to pull this off. Lester. Katie Turr, thanks very much. Uh, all this conversation about Ohio, let's go there. NBC's Chris Jansing is in Cleveland watching that very tight race. Chris? <laughs> yeah, and both sides are very nervous. I can tell you this right now. And both feeling like they have an opportunity here. If you're going to watch what's going on, you got to look where I'm standing, which is in Cleveland. I spent the day at a polling place there. It was very telling. Uh, there was a burst around lunchtime, but in the morning when you would expect a lot of people, later in the day when you would expect a lot of people as folks were going home from work, there was not a big turnout. Uh, the director of the elections board he, here in Cuyahoga County was saying, well, I still think that we'll get up around 67 percent, but the reports that were coming in weren't that there were lines, weren't that there was any big last minute rush. And I will tell you, one thing to look at from the exit polls is the economy, very important to people here in the Rust Belt, and who it is better at handling it. Donald Trump beating Hillary Clinton in the exit polls by four points. And I want to tell you just one anecdotal story. As I was speaking with folks in this largely African-American voting place, I said, are most of your friends and family voting? And more than half in this unscientific survey said to me they knew people who weren't voting. And I thought it might be about the tenor of the race. They said it wasn't that at all. They felt as African Americans that the resurgence in the economy had not impacted them, that they were not being served by Washington. So watch this vote coming in in Cuyahoga County and that reaction from an unexpected place. Chris Jansen, thank you very much. Stay with us. When we come back, we're going to talk live with Senator Rand Paul, who NBC News projects has been reelected in Kentucky. Our Decision Night in America coverage continues here on NBC.
Welcome back. Decision night in America. Look at the map. Those are the battleground states. And if we had to title this segment, Chuck Todd, I would call it. There's a reason they call them battleground states. There sure are. Look at those up there that you're seeing. Michigan, less than 1,000 votes. Virginia, basically we're looking at three percentage points and climbing. Florida, uh, less than a percentage point. Ohio. Now watch. Let me take you to New Hampshire. This one, 200 votes at, at this point. Uh, a difference there. Let me take you down to North Carolina. Look at this one. We got about 20,000 votes out of more than 3 million cast. I'll take you back to Florida one more time, as you can see. We're at, uh, again, we're still waiting, mostly for Broward County. As soon as that gets in, we're going to feel comfortable going one way or the other, but it may take a long time. And by the way, Colorado, I want to show you this. You know, about 100,000 vote difference, still only 32% in, but still she's winning, but not by big numbers. And there were a lot of people that thought Colorado, just like Virginia, was somehow going to end up being sort of out of the uh, out of the battleground. Savannah, neither, so neither side right now can feel good. Or, I mean, it, it's it's a suspended animation. No, here. And, and I think there's some real jitters setting in, in Clinton headquarters right now. And as Katie Tour reported, some hope on the Trump side. And you look at something like Colorado and Virginia, these are battlegrounds. And yet, these are two states that I think back in August, the Clinton campaign stopped really spending money mm -hmm. in, feeling like these were in the bag. And when you look at polls recently from these states, they showed Clinton with a healthy lead, and look where we are right now. I mean, of course, everything, the caveats are there. Virginia, we're waiting for some northern Virginia counties that would be expected to go for Clinton big, and that may make all the difference. But I think what's incredible here is just how tight all of these races are. We're going to take a break. We'll check in all the races that are still too close to call, which means the rest of the night here. Where things stand right now, who's ahead? Don't go anywhere. Our Decision Night in America coverage continues here on NBC. Looking at uh, Democracy Plaza here in New York City. And there you see right now where things stand on the race to 270. Donald Trump with 137. Uh, Hallie Jackson in the newsroom with what else we're learning about the mood of the electorate. Some more exit polling. Hallie. Hey there, Lester. Gotcha. We are uh, here in the middle of our election center talking with our political unit and specifically talking with our pollsters. We've got our team of pollsters here pouring through some of the data. I'm going to head over. You look ready for me here. Right. here. Uh, Bill McIntyre, who's one of our folks. Bill, when we talk about this being a nail biter, I'm going to kind of perch back here. What are you seeing in some of these races where it is too close to call? How much of a nail biter is it? Well, it's certainly very close in a, in a number of states, and the reason for that is simple. We're seeing some of the largest divisions we have ever seen between urban America and rural America. Donald Trump is winning white non-college men by a margin we haven't seen since Ronald Reagan. And on the other hand, uh, Secretary Clinton is winning African Americans, Latinos. There's sort of a two different Americas, and we're watching them kind of fight each other to a draw tonight in a few of these states in ways that is just, again, reflects enormous division, yeah. much bigger than we've normally seen. Fred, spin around here in your chair. Uh, what do you say? I mean, obviously, I think you're seeing the same kind of data that Bill is. Is this an illustration of just how divided the nation is? Are we in for a night that's going to go past 3 a.m.? I think um, some of the divisions Bill talked about, what I'm noticing in, in, in my study is uh, even bigger gender gap. Hmm that um, Trump is doing better with male voters than Romney did four years ago, and Mrs. Clinton's doing slightly better with women voters than Obama did four years ago. That's making for a very tight election. All right. Fred Yang, Bill McInturf. We've got Peter Hart over in the corner, who we're going to come back and chat with a little bit more about these key swing states of Michigan, of Florida. This is our working newsroom, by the way. This is sort of, again, the engine room of our election center. The notebooks are out. The binders are out as these guys dig through the data. Lester? All right. Hallie, thanks for... Thanks very much. And, you know, one of, one of the things we, we've not talked a lot about in this campaign is the historic nature of Hillary Clinton's campaign. She's not made a big deal out of it, but, but as we see her perform with women voters, how does it play? You know, it's very interesting because in 2008, one of the things that the campaign concluded was that she didn't make more of the historic nature of her candidacy the way that Barack Obama had with his candidacy as the first African-American. I think they dabbled in making it more of an issue, more of a focus of an, a possible appeal to voters. But it never really caught on that way. I mean, if she were elected tonight, of course, it would make history. But um, I just don't see that as a point of emphasis from her in, in, in the campaign as much as you might think it would be. All right, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back with more from NBC News elections.
control in a few minutes. Back now from our NBC News Election Center in New York. This is a very tight race between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Many states right now are too close to call. As I think we all suspected, it is going to be a long night. Let's go through some of those states right now and show you where things stand. Uh, first of all, as we look at the national, the popular vote right now, uh, Trump at 50 percent. Uh, Florida right now continues to be too close to call. 141,000 vote difference there. Michigan, it's emerged as a very important state down the stretch. 28,000 vote uh, difference. That is too close to call. Ohio, too close to call. You see the difference there. That could go way, way into the night or early morning. North Carolina, too close to call, 56,000 vote difference. Let's look at Georgia. This uh, Hillary Clinton drawing close there down the stretch. That is too close to call. You see the difference on the screen there. New Hampshire, uh, that's New Hampshire right now, is too close to call as well. A 1,700 uh, vote difference with 22% of the votes in. And Pennsylvania, this is where Hillary Clinton wound up her campaign with that big rally with the Obamas last night. 156,000 vote difference, 16% of the vote in. And the guy that's watching the minutia of this and trying to understand and explain it to us is Chuck Dodd. Well, so you said we're looking at 140,000 vote difference. We get 94% in. Most of the vote is left is in Miami and, Day, uh, Miami and Broward. There's more vote in Broward left than Day. She's winning this 67-31. The bottom line is this. How much vote is left and what percentage does she win it by? If there's 400,000 votes left, okay, and I'm just going to do it this way. There's 400,000 votes left and she wins it 70-30, she'll net, she'll net 140,000 votes. That's assuming all that. Now let me go back to where Florida is. Whoops. Sorry about that. Um, show you the total vote here in Florida. It's about 140,000. My point is this. I don't know if there's enough vote left for Clinton to win, and I don't know if Trump can hang on. We are looking at a Florida, I don't think it's going to be closer than 537 votes, Nicole, but it is going to be less than a percentage point at this point. And, and then it becomes, we just don't know. And then it gets down to what, what was your strategy without Florida? Each of them had one. She, going into this, That's right. had a better, uh, Look, when it score, goes, more roots. Right. No, it, if him with Florida, and it's a straight shot, it's, he can do Michigan. He doesn't need both Michigan and Pennsylvania. Never mind, by the way, we still got North Carolina sitting out there that's too close to call. Virginia is too close to call. New Hampshire sitting too close to call. So, look, it is, I can tell you this, if you're the Clinton campaign, because of the way the rest of the map looks... Uh, you don't want to see Florida go red yet. And Nicole, if you're if you're the Trump campaign right now, you're starting to feel signs of of life. Well, you're saying I told you so. In that this was a lot closer than any of us. I'll put myself in this category and myself alone. But th than I thought, and that the polls reflected. I think the the amalgamation of polls showed Hillary Clinton this morning with an 85 percent chance of winning. This doesn't feel like that kind of night. And Trump supporters, and I know this because I have several of my family is divided right down the middle, generationally actually, between Trump supporters and Clinton supporters. They felt like there could be a Brexit effect, and we don't have enough information to know if that's the case. But this definitely will if she wins she will not win it running away and if he wins he will prove uh, just about everybody who does what I do wrong and, and we should say that I mean the surprise factor is we knew that we weren't going to have a call this early in the night it was going to be close yeah, but I mean, the Clinton camp thought they did I mean I, I have to say the Clinton campaign for the last at least 72 hours has been projecting a lot of confidence But here's why I mean the Trump campaign didn't have the same turnout operation as the Clinton campaign and we saw some of the demographic groups, and I think what everybody underestimated was the Trump, the rural vote coming in as high as it did. And you know what? I think we have to start to say maybe whether it was a, I don't want to say it was a hidden Trump vote. Mm -hmm. I just think we didn't have our weights correct. And we didn't realize that he was going to bust through the caps, essentially, of what it, turnout caps in those uh, ruby red counties and well, even in ex-urban uh, ex America. Yeah, from, you know from the beginning Donald Trump has been running from the ground up not from the top down 
I mean, he's tapped in to all those people out there who are feeling disenfranchised. I was looking at Iowa the other day. It used to be a very progressive state. Yeah. You know, it was a state of uh, it was a state of Harold Hughes, for example, and John Culver and Dick Clark. Now it's a very conservative evangelical state because they're very uncomfortable with the cultural shifts in right. this country. Not just the economy, same-sex marriage. They're not happy about that. Mm -hmm. They're not happy about a lot of things that are going on. So they moved into the right, and Don Trump, Donald Trump, came along and tapped into all of that by going down at the bottom level and working his way up. And uh, the fact is that he has astonished everyone from the very beginning of all of this, including the last 48 hours. However, this turns out tonight. It's going to be so much closer than anybody could have realized going right. in. We ought to bring up what's going on with Dow futures mm. right now. Yeah. I mean, that is just Mar all of the stock markets around the world are Mar cratering. Margin calls. Yes. Everyone. Uh, I've, I've had a note from somebody saying, you know, they're beginning to sell off uh, because they're, it went the other way in the last 24 hours, by the way. When everybody thought she was going to win. Yeah. Right. That's right. The there's FBI a letter, popular website where people can put together their own electoral maps called 270 to win. As far as I can tell, it's being it's crashed right now. I think everyone in America <laughs> is like, true. they're starting to How does this work? Everybody, there's no Florida. What's the matter? Everybody path? wants to be Chuck Todd. you got to talk to the master here. Yes. He can walk so, you through it. Let's yeah. get to Raheem Ellis on the ground in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, one of the many places that's going to keep us here late, Raheem. Absolutely, Lester, and we're at a watch party for the incumbent Governor Pat McCrory, and with me is the executive director of North Carolina Republican Party, and I'm talking with Dallas Woodhouse. Uh, it's, this is a toss-up state. How are you feeling? You got butterflies in your stomach? Well, I, I feel more nervous than a fish at a fish fry, uh, you know, so no question about that. However, we are in a great position at this point in the evening. Urban areas tend to come in sooner, and I uh, you know, Mr. Trump looks like he's well on his way to win. The governor's race is going to be close, but the governor just went up. Normally, once you go, go up more than halfway across, you don't go back down. I will just tell you a couple of things. We were up, as Republicans, 100,000 votes over 2012 at the end of early voting. The Democrats were down 22,000. Okay, uh, that's that, the early voting, but now you've got the voting today. Well, right, but you have to remember that Republicans win Election Day. Uh, Democrats win uh, early voting, and they did win early voting. And, and, that, and that's what you did in 2012. In, in 2008, Barack Obama took this state. You think that Trump is going to take it quickly? Tell me. I record. do believe that we're going to win uh, Trump, Burr, and McCroy tonight. Close races, but a good night for Republicans. They are opti uh, cautiously optimistic here. Lester? All right, Rahama, thanks very much. Let's go to uh, Mariana Atencio right now. She is in Miami right now with a family who is nervously watching these uh, results in Florida where things are extraordinarily tight. <laughs> Lester, I'm here with several families. In fact, at this local watch party in Miami, many of the people you see behind me are undocumented. Some are voters, and as you can imagine, the mood here grew incredibly tense as these results started to tighten. Like many Latinos across the country, for many of the voters here, their main motivation was what they call the Trump effect or the Trump factor, mainly the Republican candidate's stance on immigration that crystallized the issues for so many Latinos. And as you have been covering throughout the night, we have seen a record turnout by Latinos in several battleground states. Here in Florida, a 75 percent increase in early voting by Latinos compared to 2020. 12, but just the fact that Donald Trump appears to be leading in the polls now just brought back the issue of immigration to a gathering like this one you see behind me. It is not the only issue Latinos care about, but it is a very personal one, and you can see it right here. Many of these families holding hands. They even held a prayer not too long ago as they anxiously await these election results and fear, Lester, their families could be split up if Donald Trump, in fact, wins the presidency. All right, Mariana, thanks very much. I think we are at a point in the evening. It's time to revisit. I'm going to walk with you because it's time to revisit <laughs> this. The what if map this, here? Yeah, the, the route to 270. Yes. Well, and, and Florida was such a big part of it. Let, so Let's for now, and we're just going to do it. We're not projecting anything. We're just going to give it. Okay, so let's say Trump's leading there. He's leading in Georgia. He's leading in North Carolina. He's leading in Ohio. He's sitting at 248. 
Uh, let's assume Arizona sits at 259 there. He's not leading in New Hampshire. We do have this Nebraska situation. Let's, I don't know why we haven't. Let, let's, it's split. It's yeah. split, but it should be. He's already gotten those that we are aware of. So let's do Nevada's that. Nevada's sitting out there. Here. Nevada is sitting out there. We're going to keep it. So that's what's sitting here. But this assumed Michigan. So watch. You just flip Michigan here. Now let's give her New Hampshire for now. She does. There is some work there. And then, and then you look. But he's over the top. Sees, he would be over the top with, with a Michigan uh, at this point. She needs one of these states. Let's put back North Carolina. That would do it. But as you can see here, now Michigan, look, take Michigan away, and it's, a, and it's a different situation. But this is what we're staring at. It doesn't take long, by the way, and there's some, we know there's some interesting things on Twitter. It doesn't take long to get you to 269, 269. I could do it right here by simply moving Colorado, and then you would have here. I don't know why we have three extras. I think Nebraska's um, gotten messed up on our map here. Yeah. So we will just neutralize them. Um, but this is, that should be red. It's already counted in the total here. So point is, uh, this is precarious. This map is suddenly 50-50. And you know, both this, sides, both sides gonna, are doing exactly what right. you just did. This is no longer, if he sweeps those two in, in Ohio, and we're looking at Michigan, it's too close to call, and then suddenly we could be sitting on Michigan, could be sitting on Colorado. I mean, it's... It's going to be a. It's going to be a long night. It's going to be. If you're a junkie, it's going to be a fun night. I mean, we are dividing up this map in ways that we haven't seen. 269, 269 is in play. Um, this feels a lot like 2000, Brokaw. This story is writing itself. You okay, Tom? Yeah. <laughs> I got the smelly salts. Right? Yeah, you got it. You're right. I, I, I brought my old script with me, so it's okay. okay. I can just go back to that. I, I may uh, need to borrow it. We're going to take a quick break. We continue to monitor those states that are still too close to call. We'll bring them to you as soon as we get word from our decision desk. Could happen any time. You'll want to stay with us. Our decision night in America coverage continues here on NBC. That's a view of Democracy Plaza outside our studios at 30 Rock here in New York on what is a dramatic night that has uh, even more drama on top of it. There's the national vote total right now. The popular vote, Trump ahead 49 47 percent. But folks, this is a night about the battleground states. We knew it would be, but it is far closer than many imagined. Florida right now, too close to call, 139,000 vote difference. Let's look at the state of Michigan here that Clinton was forced to defend down the stretch, a 50,000 vote difference, too close to call. Ohio, a perennial battleground state, too close to call. You see the difference there? North Carolina right now, an 84,000 vote difference, too close to call. Same story in Georgia, a state that uh, uh, Clinton was hoping to turn blue. Very close there as well, too close. New Hampshire, look at New Hampshire right there. 1,300, 1,400 votes uh, separate the two of them. And Pennsylvania, also too close to call. The state that Hillary Clinton uh, made her big finish last night. A lot of drama here on this night. And uh, in the race to 270, here's where things stand. Base, stand based on the projections we've made so far, 137 in the Trump column, 104 to Hillary Clinton. And there's the map right now unfolding on the rink below us. That's a swath of red, a lot of gray still to be unfinished, which will tell the story of this night when they are filled in. But right now they're not, and the biggest one hanging out there, literally hanging out there, is Florida. And it, I have to say, I think this looks good for Trump. Um, in, in Florida. I, in Florida. I think with what's left, it just depends on how much is left. And Nicole remembers this mythical 50,000 vote box or something and switches so you know there's going to be but um, as the Broward vote has continued to come in we're now at about 75 80 percent of the Broward vote is in and she has not narrowed that gap and there's nowhere else in the state that, there's that she not a lot up. left you know look a pre one precinct in Miami can be worth can can have a hundred thousand votes in it so that does happen in those big counties so you don't know for sure but I don't think she needs as I said She's still behind 140,000 votes. She needs to hope there's, I keep saying, 400,000 votes remaining and she wins them 70-30. Or 500,000 votes and she wins them 65-35. But I don't know if there's that many votes. What about the other, right. the other two close to call states? Yeah, but we still got a ways to go here. North Carolina, you still have a ton of, there's just too much vote out to say. I mean, I, I, I take the, the Republican Party chair, uh, uh, spokesperson, Dallas Woodhouse's word for it that, you know, 
it's you'd rather be Trump than Clinton right now, but still too much. I can tell you in Virginia, I think if you show, if we can go down and show Virginia right now, it's narrowed to like 11,000. And this one is now starting to look like she is likely to end up getting what she needs here. As you see, it's now 10,000, but we're still waiting for a bunch of Fairfax, Northern Virginia. And she'll likely win Virginia, but by the smallest of margins. And we have to wait to see if these folks actually turned out. But Virginia is trending her way narrowly, okay? But we may be, I'm, we mess around that, right? It may be Michigan. Michigan. Michigan is going to be the linchpin. If he, if he wins Florida and North Carolina and Ohio, we're going to be sitting here waiting on Michigan. And Lester, you nobody can't, was you can't talking discount about Michigan five days ago. Sorry. I wouldn't discount yeah. Pennsylvania yet, but I still would rather be her than him. Yeah. All right, let's go to Hallie, to Hallie Jackson now. Hallie? Hey, Lester, I'm joined here by filmmaker Michael Moore, who has spent months really diving into the mind of the Trump voter. You are a Hillary Clinton supporter, uh, but you have predicted what we are seeing with Donald Trump, particularly in Michigan, for months. Well, back in the summer, I wrote an essay uh, called The Brexit States, right. uh, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, that um, the, the working class that has been um, so abused and attacked and their livelihood taken from them over these last really couple decades. They're at the point where they're so angry and full of so much despair that I could see that they were going to use the ballot box as an anger management exercise. You've called it a middle finger to the establishment. Yes, or, or, or Trump being their human Molotov cocktail that they just get to throw into the system today and blow it up, only to find out a month or two from now how regretful they're going to be because he's not only going to blow up the system, He's not, he has no idea how to rebuild it. So when we talk about a state like Michigan, which came on sort of late in the game as a really important battleground when we're seeing what we're seeing there tonight, which is this state incredibly close and potentially a turning point for Donald Trump, you're a guy who knows Michigan pretty well. Are you surprised by that? Not at all. No. I mean, this has been my fear. I've been trying to uh, tell people we have to put special focus on Michigan, on Ohio and Pennsylvania. Are these are the people I grew up with. I know, I know what's going on here. They're being manipulated by a con artist. That's what Donald Trump is. He has not told them the truth. They're, he's, they're not, he's not going to bring their jobs back. And, and he is, he's really, he's, the, he's a dying dinosaur. His way of doing things, and that old, that's the old America. We're into, a, right. into the future right now. Michael Moore, thank you very much. Former Bernie Sanders supporter, now a Hillary Clinton supporter. Lester, we'll toss it back to you over on the other side of our election center. All right, Hallie, thanks. Up next, we're going to get a live report on the ground in what is perhaps the most surprising battleground state of the entire election. Plus, we're awaiting poll closings in four more states, including Nevada. Stay with us. As we come back from a break, this is a picture that Ivanka Trunk uh, tweeted out a short while ago seeing uh, Mike Pence and Donald Trump uh, and uh, the family and uh, staffers watching returns here, like the rest of us, trying to figure out where this is all leading. Let's go to Katie Turr at Trump headquarters. Katie? quite confident uh, in where they stand at this moment. They still concede that this is going to be a tight race, uh, but it's looking even better than it ever has, frankly. Their eyes are on Florida right now. Uh, two uh, uh, Donald Trump sources are telling us, uh, Florida operatives, excuse me, are telling us that it's a nail-biter, that, but that they will win it. They're holding their breath and they're waiting on uh, more results from Broward County. A source in Virginia tells us to watch out for Virginia Beach. They believe that they could see uh, quite a bit of turnout in that area. After they go from Florida, North Carolina, Ohio, and Iowa, then they're going to go on and keep their focus on Michigan. If they can turn Michigan, they are going to feel very confident about this race. They have said for quite a while now that they believe Michigan is a state that is particularly susceptible to Donald Trump's message, his jobs message. They believe it's one that cuts across demographics, one uh, that won't, it won't matter what race you are. You'll want to vote for jobs rather than vote along party lines, and they believe that they're going to be able to do that. All right, let's go to Andrea Mitchell. She is at Clinton headquarters. How are they reading these numbers, Andrea? They are about as nervous as every other Democrat around. I mean, look, this place is so down. They're playing videos and also coverage. Now there's a cheer that's gone up because they, uh, they see some movement in Virginia. 
Virginia critical, as you know. They were waiting to see what was happening in Fairfax County and in Richmond. But the fact is that the results in Michigan and in Ohio and in Florida are really depressing the mood here. That's the first year I've heard here basically all night for anything other than an East Coast uh, state like uh, Rhode Island or Connecticut, pro forma. The mood here is very, very depressed and nervous. And the fact is they're going to have to look back at what they didn't do. They had a two-to-one spending advantage on air, on television, a five-to-one advantage in terms of paid and volunteer staff. They had a much bigger ground game across the country, pulled money out of Virginia and Colorado, and they've got a lot of thinking to do uh, about what is happening here tonight if this thing does go against them. All right, Andrea, and, and that crowd, we heard them applaud a minute ago. The, uh, he just, Officially, let's, let's, put up, let's put, yeah, up Virginia, put up the Virginia board if we can. First time that she took the lead, she and that's what they were looking at. Move forward there. Uh, and, uh, there it is. There the she took the narrow lead. And I, I can just tell you my own history of doing this. We know where this is headed, but wow, it's close. She had to work for it. That's right. All right. We're quickly approaching 10 p.m. in the east, 7 o'clock out west. Polls about to close in four more states. Stick around. Our decision night in America coverage continues on a dramatic night here on NBC. Welcome back, everyone. It's 10 p.m. in the east, 7 p.m. in the west. We're live from NBC News election headquarters in New York, and this, folks, is a razor-thin race for president. Many states too close to call. The polls have just closed in four more states. Let's take you through what we have. As you look first at the national vote total, looking first at the state of Iowa, it is too close to call. Nevada, too close to call. Utah, too early. Keep in mind that's a uh, keep in mind that's a three-way race uh, uh, with McMullen in the race there in Utah. Montana, uh, NBC News projects that Donald Trump will win in Montana, and we can perhaps take a look now where we stand in that race to 270. And here's where it stacks up right now. Based on the projections we've made so far, Trump with 140, Clinton with 104. We're also watching, among the many states we're watching uh, where things are close, the state of Pennsylvania, as we, uh, we take a look right there at the map. But if we can move out, I want to show you what's happening in Pennsylvania, because we want to go to our correspondent there, uh, Kate Snow, who is with both Trump and Clinton uh, voters. Uh, Kate? Hey, Lester. Yeah, we are right outside of Philadelphia, Montgomery County, which we said earlier is kind of an area that you really need to watch in Pennsylvania. And it's interesting. We're in a bar, obviously. We got a lot of Trump fans here. And I was talking to Lisa before. Tell me again, you, you were telling me that you didn't even want to put a sign out in front of your house because you're a business owner. But, but now, how are you feeling right now? I'm so excited. I am just beyond excited because now you can outwardly say, this is the guy I wanted. This is the guy who spoke his mind. This is the guy that's going to fight for us. Why did you vote for him? Why have you been working for him as a volunteer? Why? Yeah, because he's he again, he's going to take our country back. Um, there are different things that again, as a business owner, you you want to just it, it, taxes, um, you know, Obamacare. Yeah. There are just all these different. And you, you said to me earlier that you felt like he says the things that other people don't say out loud. No, they don't. And, and people say, well, he said this about women. He said that, you know, I mean, what is the, he said that I don't hear other women saying about men? You know, women talk about men all the time and have said worse than he's ever said. Lisa, thank you. We got a, a whole table full of Trump supporters, but let me pivot over here. We actually asked some folks to move over here who voted for, for Hillary Clinton. Um, how are you feeling? You're watching the TVs in here. The sound isn't up, but you can see what's happening. How are you feeling? A little bit nervous. I, I'm a little bit surprised about Florida being so close. Um, I don't want it to go back to a, a, a Bush Gore thing where they have to recount the votes. And but I really think it's going to come down to Florida. Everybody's nodding along at the table. Nobody wants a recount again. Me, myself included. I was in Tallahassee for a long time. Tell me why you think this county might go for Montgomery County might go for Hillary Clinton. Oh, I'm actually from Illinois, but oh, okay, okay. <laughs> You're from Philly. Okay. Well, we got a mixed crowd in the in the bar. But why did you vote for her? Oh, well, actually, I didn't vote because I'm not American, but I'm 
I'm a, a healer in support. Okay. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Lester, I would say um, it's very loud in here. There's a DJ playing behind me, so folks can't really hear all of our coverage, but we've got it all on the screens, and people are glued to the screens. And just a note about Pennsylvania and where we are. We're hearing that the lines were so long in some places that people are still voting. Even though polls closed technically at 8 o'clock Eastern time, two hours ago, people are still in line. In certain parts of the state, I'm hearing Adams County, I'm hearing around Pittsburgh, and in Philadelphia, there are still lines out there. Lester? 34% of the vote in Pennsylvania. Clinton in the head. Uh, Kate, thanks very much. We have a, another projection coming in. I'm told it's uh, New Mexico. NBC News projects that Hillary Clinton will win the five electoral votes in the state of New Mexico. Let's go to uh, Hallie Jackson right now, who is digging deeper into some of these numbers on this uh, very, very tight race right now uh, in the exit poll. And, and Lester, we're looking at three key battleground states right now, states that are extremely close in our battleground map. Let's start with Michigan because we've been talking about that all night. We want to focus on what's driving this close race in these states. And in Michigan, at this moment, our exit polls are showing it appears to be white voters without a college degree. Look at this column here, the Republican candidate. The Republican candidate in 2012 got 55% of the vote. Donald Trump right now is doing better, up six points. So he is overperforming the Republican from 2012. Mitt Romney. And look at the Democratic candidate, of course, Hillary Clinton. In 2012, Barack Obama, the Democrat, got 44% of the vote. She is down 13 percentage points from that position, from where they were in 2012. So that is really what's we're looking at and what we're sort of diving into when it comes to Michigan. I want to pull up Pennsylvania now because we're taking a look at the age gap, right? Voters in Pennsylvania under the age of 30, the so-called millennials, if you will. They're turning out, they're breaking out for Hillary Clinton by 55% to 39%. It is the flip, the reverse of that, when you look at voters over 65 going more for Donald Trump. He's got about 50% of the vote. She's got 48% of the vote. And then in another key battleground state, we want to look at the race breakout in Florida. Let's pull it up here. Those voters in Florida who have a favorable opinion of Donald Trump. Most white voters in Florida do have a favorable opinion. One in four Hispanic voters roughly have a favorable opinion. But only one in ten black voters feel that same way. And this demographic here, the African-American vote, the Hispanic vote, that is going to be crucial to what we see in Florida when it comes to turnout. Uh, I did speak with one source close to the Trump campaign who said, hey, we are not getting crushed with the Hispanic vote right now, and that is a good sign for them. Lester? Hallie Jackson, thanks. Back to our panel. And joining us now is Mike Murphy, an NBC News political analyst who served as senior strategist for John McCain's first campaign for president in 2000. And, and Mike, nice to have you here. For those who thought this was going to be an early evening, you say. Yeah, anything yeah. but. I thought it would be an early evening. I thought Florida State, I worked a lot, and most of the political hacks on both sides saw so it would be a two to three point early defeat for Trump, and that would set the tone. Instead, Florida now is going to be hard. Mike, Mike, I'm going to ask you to hold off again. Yep. We have another call here I'm in the state of Missouri, and NBC News projects that Missouri will go to Donald Trump. Donald Trump will win. Uh, and let's look at where things stand right now. There's a, uh, there's a Missouri call, and let me show the, um, where we stand in the race to 270. There it is right now. Uh, Trump at 150, Clinton 109, the race to 270. Mike, I cut you off. I'm sorry. Go ahead. What's interesting about Florida is the pattern is unlike anything I've seen in Florida politics before. You get a more urban Republican area like Jacksonville, Duval County, Trump's doing horribly. He's doing under Romney in the bigger Tampa counties. But you go north of Tampa to the exurbs, he's off the charts. He is breaking the meter like numbers we haven't seen before. And that's moving the whole state to a point where, well, I believe it'll tighten. There's more of her vote out than his. Yeah, I don't think she's going to well, be able but, to make but it. So far, he hasn't won anything that we didn't anticipate. But you, Chuck, you're not, punching the numbers in Florida. You I, think? I, look, it, it just, there's just not enough. I, I just, you know, we'll, maybe there's some extra vote that we don't know about. And again, I, I stress that. That happens. And I remember vividly in 2000, the 50,000 vote error that was discovered um, late. So, you know, right. don't forget those things happen here. But you look, and there's trickles that are left. Almost every county has reported. What's out is there's only one county that's out that's more favorable to Trump. Polk has a little right. bit. But Volusia, which is Daytona, essentially, and that's basically a 50-50 county, there's a lot of Volusia out, but that's not enough for her to gain ground. It's Palm Beach, Miami, and Broward. Right. I, is there enough vote out there left in those bottom three counties for her to close this gap? But I have to tell you, 
the gap grew again. She got it down to 111,000, uh, and then it's back up to 130. So I, yeah. I don't see the path forward for her in Florida. And so now, listen to this. Last time a Democrat won the White House without the state of Florida was Bill Clinton, 1992. So maybe she's got that karma going for her. I don't know. And but the last time you lost Florida and Ohio and still won the White House was John Kennedy. But her other, other paths carry her through some of these other states that are too close to call right yes, now. Yes, right? but we're looking at a situation here, I think, that it's Michigan. <clears throat> I really do that. At the end of the day, we're staring I, at Michigan. I, I go through this. I, Pennsylvania, she probably does eke it out. We'll see. Um, she has to do that, but we're looking at Michigan being what the big What is so fascinating here. is nobody was talking about Michigan until about five days ago. Except Michael Moore. I'll give him that. He Ma has well, been Michael screaming Moore. about it, right. to his credit. Right, to his credit. It is his home state. We yes. all like to talk about our home states. The we look at Chuck with Florida, but I mean, Trump they saw something going on in Michigan. They sent him there, and people were saying, what? And then the Clinton team added a stop. President Obama was there. we put Michigan there. on the screen to see where and we are? Somebody who's done a lot of governor campaigns in both Florida and Michigan, yep. there's one difference. Michigan go. has rural counties that are more democratic in many places compared to Sunbelt and Southern they states. They have been. Yeah, they have been. Will Trump really turn that over? And will Detroit vote and Flint what it normally does, or will it be under enough that Trump's overage in some of these places will make it. And Trump is doing well in some of these smaller counties right now at the beginning, but there's a lot of Michigan still out. It's going to be tight. It's but it's be tight. been totally underestimated by those of us in the so-called press establishment and the people who have been looking at this is the depth of the anger. The yep. depth of the people saying, I want to change. I don't care if I have to pull a pin on a grenade and roll it across the country. Whatever it takes, we want change and we want big change. But the other thing we did, and I have to say this, is that I think in general, and the biggest critique on, on the establishment, and I throw the media in here, as yep. well as the two political parties, is um, we've overlooked rural America a bit too much. Yep. And I think in hindsight, I said, you know, everybody's been talking about the changing demographics of America and the changing face of America. That's all true. Um, but we've forgotten about rural America, and rural America is basically saying, um, hello, they're, they are screaming at us to say, stop overlooking us. You know, we're not ready to have just 21st century fly by us. But some of this has been hiding in plain sight. I mean, Donald Trump came in with a message that is very distinct and very different from Republican orthodoxy, from Republican, the way that the Republicans have always run as free traders, and sure. they love free trade mm -hmm. agreements. and. If if his message is resonating, this is where it was going to resonate. If yeah. it was going to make a difference, this is exactly where. So in some ways, ultimately, it's not surprising that now we're focused like a laser on this section of the country. And building a bit of a new coalition with that economic populism. But will it have long enough legs? We'll see. Yeah, well, we still have hours to go here. And by the way, if you have a restaurant that delivers breakfast, I'd call them right now. <laughs> <laughs> we are joining us now is conservative political commentator and host Glenn Beck, founder of The Blaze. Glenn, nice to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Give us, give us your take on what is happening here, because things are a lot tighter than uh, many had imagined tonight. Yeah, a lot tighter than I um, imagined um, as well. Um, you know, I, I think uh, what Chuck just said was exactly right on the money. We have not listened to, um, you know, I think Chuck said the heartland, but I don't think we've listened to each other um, at all. And I know I've been at fault on this. Um, in the last couple of years, I've really tried to analyze myself and analyze what, I, what I've done and what I do. and. Um, we don't listen to each other and we don't trust each other and you know the media that includes me that unfortunately Tom includes you I, I can't believe it would but it does that 34 percent of Americans trust any of our voices and that is because um, uh, they view us as speaking down to them um, pontificating telling them and not listening to them declaring who they are it's, it's um, difficult for me to um, consider myself a conservative or to consider myself a Republican tonight. If this is what a, rec a conservative or a Republican is, then I, I'm not part of that. I don't want anything to do with that. Um, but I understand why people are feeling this way when you have, what is it, 60% uh, of the people who voted for Donald Trump don't like that they're voting for Donald Trump, and 54% who are voting for Hillary Clinton 
aren't happy about so, voting for Hillary Clinton. So at the end of this, they, are you going to have a lot of orphan voters, people that feel, like yourself, that don't feel they have a place? I think the majority um, feel that way. Even those people who voted for either one of these, they're not happy with it. Um, and so I think on both sides, the parties have to realize now, boy, we, we need to start reflecting the people and listening to the people because the people are entering a time, as we're seeing tonight, beyond reason. Um, they're not listening. When you get into so much fear or so much anger, um, it, it, you know, the, the mind's mechanism is just to shut down reason. And they're not listening to reason. And we have got to find our way to each other. I'm, my goal in the next year is to meet with the people I think I disagree with the most and not try to talk them into anything, not try to have an argument with them. Yep. I just want to listen. I want to be able to say, is this what you believe and why you believe it? And when they say yes, then we could even begin to have a conversation. But at least right. for me, that's a year away before I could have a conversation. We have to start listening to people. Glenn if Beck. we don't, we're in trouble. Glenn Beck, good to have you on. Thanks so much for spending some time Thank with you. us from Dallas there. We continue to monitor the close races still up for grabs. We're waiting more poll closings. Stay with us. Things remain razor, razor thin right now. We've got more coverage of Decision Night in America next. Welcome back. A view of the Rake Democracy Plaza. The map uh, slowly filling in. We are waiting for a lot of states too close to call. It's a nail biter of a night. The race to 270. You saw the numbers there. I want to show you a, a tweet that uh, Hillary uh, Clinton put out uh, a little bit after 5 o'clock uh, this afternoon. It says, uh, I'm going to try and read it from here. This team has so much to be proud of. Uh, whatever happens tonight, Thank you for everything. That, by the way, was before any of the polls closed. But uh, that again from uh, Hillary Clinton. We're also we're also watching the Dow futures right now, reacting to this night. The Dow futures down uh, 625 points right now as uh, investors continue to watch what's happening here. Uh, this race a lot closer at this point in the night than many people had anticipated, and it's going to keep us up all here quite late tonight. A lot of states too close to call. Let's go to Kristen Welker right now at Clinton headquarters. Kristen. Lester, good evening. I've been talking to top Clinton campaign officials and her top surrogates, and they say they're not panicking. They still insist there is a path to win, even if they don't hold Florida or Ohio, not that they are conceding those states. The path for them, the states that they are focused on right now, include Michigan, Colorado, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. Lester, we've spent so much time talking about Pennsylvania. That is her firewall. That's where she held that massive rally last night, more than 30,000 people joined by the Obamas and, of course, her husband, that big unity rally. But I can tell you that I've been talking to Democrats who were invited here to what they were hoping would be a watch party and victory party, and they are candidly acknowledging that they have begun to get nervous, uh, that this is a very close race. They were anticipating that, but obviously it's turning into a much closer race than they had hoped for. The mood here when this night initially got underway was a bullion. This crowd was breaking out into cheers throughout the evening. Now it has become much quieter. Those moments of cheering have become fewer and far between. But again, they still think they have a path and they are very focused on the state of Michigan and Pennsylvania at this hour, Lester. All right, right now, as you see on the screen, Trump leading in the electoral race with 150 to Clinton's 109. This could be, this will be a very long night. We'll be here with you every step of the way, keeping a close eye on those very tight battleground races. More poll closings coming up. We invite you to stay with us. We'll be right back. We're quickly back from the break. We have a new projection. The state of Ohio, NBC News projects when the votes are counted, Ohio will go to Donald Trump. Donald Trump will win Ohio. Chuck Todd, uh, you, you've been watching. Uh, let's first of all, let's show you where that's, that takes us in the, in the race to 270 right now. As we come down on the ice, and right now it's 168 Trump, Clinton 109. You've been watching Florida. You don't think it's going well for Clinton there. I don't, and I think North Carolina is trending Trump here. Look, first of all, Ohio, little historical nugget. Last time somebody didn't win the White House, 
um, uh, while winning Ohio was in 1960 in Richard Nixon. Ohio is a no Republican. You, you, you have to win Ohio to win the White House. Trump has done it. Florida's trending his way. North Carolina's trending his way. This, I go back, this is, I mean, uh, uh, Luke Russert has already tweeted it. God love him. Michigan, Michigan, Michigan. We're going to be sitting here talking about Michigan. Now, because o Ohio, I agree. I was just going to say, Ohio is one where the polls seem to have gotten it right because the polls have consistently shown yeah, yeah, a tight race, but Trump up a little bit. But as you mentioned, I mean, <laughs> if he's going to no put Florida in his, in his column yeah. and Ohio, potentially North Carolina, now we're looking at the Rust Belt, Virginia, little... Close for yeah. comfort for, for Clinton. Look, they, the Clinton campaign bragged about these firewalls and these pat. Okay, well, uh, yeah. let's see if you have one. Well, how, That's how, we're about how, to find how, out. It, it, let's let's see if they have does one. Pennsylvania remain a firewall? Pennsylvania is the one state that is so far performing yeah. as they expected, not underperforming. So really, all eyes are on Michigan, although both New Hampshire and Nevada, those go ways that you're not sure, and, and then we start getting into the funky 269, 269. I guess there yet. Um, let's see how this night plays on. But look, there's still a ton of vote in Oakland County, Macomb County, and um, and in Wayne County, which is Detroit. Here's what I can tell you about Michigan and those three. Um, she's winning in Oakland. Um, she's winning in Oakland, but not by, by about 10 points. He is killing it in Macomb right now by about 20. That's the old Reagan Democrat home out there and then Wayne of course is Detroit and we just don't know how much vote is in Wayne Detroit has been a shrinking city one of the few cities in America that's sh been shrinking not expanding over the last decade she's gonna need excellent Wayne County and he'll do well in western Wayne County which are working-class suburbs and Genesee Flint and she's gonna really need to perform there because the, the 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 rural stuff is going pretty well for him and Oakland is not that big it should be a little bigger. big enough yeah, yeah. are we seeing are there any signs of it that this we've talked about the silent Trump vote the ones that didn't show up on the radar in the polls I, I wouldn't call it silent I think we underestimated the turnout in rural areas and yeah. I think a lot of the polling underestimated it, it so I, I, is it a silent Trump vote or is it more it was there it didn't activate during the primaries in these giant numbers so I think there was an, a, too many of our pros and I'd love to talk it's to our pulses about the it. base and it, and it turns out these folks they maxed out in rural America beyond maxing it out. It vindicates what Donald Trump has been That's saying right. about his totally rallies. Vindicates. Look at all these people. I got 20,000 people in this little tiny section of yeah. North Carolina or Michigan or wherever. Look at Ohio. The governor of Ohio, a very popular guy, Governor Kasich, who has gone to war against Donald Trump during this entire election season. And Rob Portman, who ran away from him, a very popular senator. Trump comes into the state and wins it. I mean, that tells you something that is extraordinary that is going on. Conventional politics ain't in play anymore, folks. Yeah, yeah. All right. In his places, they're on steroids. It is huge amounts of numbers. We've got to take a quick break here. We're going to be back more as we continue. But again, Ohio is the latest one in the uh, Trump portfolio as we watch that race to 270 on our ice at Democracy Plaza. We'll be right back. And as we come back from a break, we have a new projection. NBC News projects that Hillary Clinton will win in the state of Virginia. 13 electoral votes. Here's how it's uh, shaking out right now. Clinton had it 48, 47 percent over Trump. What does this mean to the electoral map? Let's take you down to the ice and see where things stand. Trump with 168, Clinton with 122 as our map begins to fill in. But there are some states in gray right there who are going to create a lot of upset stomachs and drama in both campaigns tonight. Let's go to Chuck Todd right now who is with some of our pollsters to get a little read on what we're seeing here and how we got here. I'm with Bill McInturf, Republican, Fred Yang, Democrat. These guys are the brains behind the NBC Wall Street Journal poll. So, Bill, uh, obviously the battlegrounds much tighter than any of the polling showed, not just ours, all of the polling. Is this the result of a hidden Trump vote and under, or us underestimating what rural America would do in turning out? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, it's not a shy vote. It's that... Uh, Donald Trump has built a unique coalition. He's winning white non-college by literally the mid-30s, higher than Ronald Reagan in uh, the year 1980, and those people are turning out. And, and it's aggregating. When you're winning uh, the rural part by 30, 35 points, it's offsetting softer turnout in some of the core urban areas. 
Um, and uh, I think that combination is pushing these states. And, and look, the other thing you want to remember is that Minnesota, Michigan, these are states that still retain a very high percentage of the white vote, very different than other parts of the country. Fred, what, how would you answer that question? I would say volatility. I think um, one of the um, interesting findings from the exit polls is among the people who decide in the last couple of days, um, they went for Trump by five points. And you say that's not a huge margin, but in a, in a race like this, where small margins make a big difference in some of these battleground states. Um, I think that, plus the fact that um, Clinton didn't perform as well with white college-educated voters as some of the pre-election polls suggested, add these all these things up, yeah. tip, tilt, tilt some of these uh, battleground states to the Trump column. Bill, you also had another fascinating nugget in the exit poll. Among voters who didn't like both candidates, who's winning? Trump's winning two to one, 45 to 27. And here's the shocker, that's 18% of the people who voted who don't like either candidate. It's almost one in five. That is three, three, three and a half times higher than the typical thing we normally see. So you've got folks, one out of five, who don't like either candidate and they voted for the guy who represents a bigger change. And not only that, Bill, you know, um, in the exit polls, 54% of Americans gave President Obama a, a positive approval rating and his designated successor is in a 50-50 fight for the presidency. Unbelievable. All right, Lester. All right. I'm coming back to the boards, buddy. <laughs> Come on back. I want right. to go up to Andrea Mitchell right now at Hillary Clinton's headquarters here in New York. You know, Andrea, one of the things we've, we've discussed over the last week or two is this notion of overconfidence. The, the, can't, the Clinton folks said they were guarding against it, but clearly there's got to be a lot of nervousness in that room right now. Well, there was a big cheer that went up with the Virginia call. That was a very big deal. And interesting that Barbara Comstock, a well-known Fairfax County Congresswoman Republican, won her seat despite the fact that Hillary Clinton is now projected to be the winner in Virginia. The crowd is now being fired up by the governor, Andrew Cuomo, speaking outside this room. But uh, other than that, there have been few speakers who have gotten their attention, so it's been a pretty quiet night here. That said, if they win Michigan, and I was talking to former Governor Jennifer Granham, who still thinks that it's possible. She acknowledges that the African-American vote in Detroit and Flint were not what they expected. They're still looking for some more Latino vote. So they're waiting to see what happens in Michigan, as you've all been pointing out. That is their hope. They've got a path, clearly. I don't really buy the argument about overconfidence. Just traveling with Hillary Clinton and watching how hard they worked and the money they've spent and the field of, of volunteers and paid staff they put out there, I think that they were determined not to leave anything on the table up until her, you know, her final homecoming at 3.30, 3.45 this morning. So. I just think that, that, that the email controversy and other, other ingredients that made her less popular, less trustworthy, uh, you just cited those polls with John Yang and Bill McIntyre, that is a residual fact. And it, when we look back on this, that last minute Comey letter, we don't know this yet anecdotally though, that last minute blow on that Friday really wasn't a momentum kill. And you know, she had to revive and pick herself up. All right, let's come on back here, Andrea. We've got another projection to make in the state of Colorado. NBC News projects Hillary Clinton will win in the state of Colorado, nine electoral votes. Uh, let me quickly get uh, Nicole in here. That's, uh, that's, that's an important one for her. That's got to... Here's what's happened. They're all important for her now and for him. But, uh, you know, with all due respect to our pollsters and everyone else's pollsters, the assumption as of noon today was that she was 3.5 points ahead. This is not the map that reflects the 3.5 3. points ahead. Right. Yeah. And you know, the, the, the Republicans in Michigan are a lot like the Republicans in a lot of the southern states that he swept. He certainly had a resonant message in big parts of states that we weren't watching, but that someone in the Trump orbit knew he had a shot at. And right now you saw there in the race to 270, it's Trump at 168, Hillary Clinton at 131. Chuck is at the map here, continuing to work these paths to 270. Look, I'm going to put him in here. Let's just, let's do Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, Trump leading in all of those. By the way, our Nebraska, a little glitch. It's all in the system. Just trust me on there. Let's go ahead and put Arizona there. So you see Trump sitting at 259. Let's give her Pennsylvania. If it holds, talk to one of, uh, one of our pollsters is an expert in Pennsylvania. He thinks she wins by two points in Pennsylvania. So let's go ahead and do that. Now you're looking at what we're looking at here. 259 to 252. I'm not 
Let's see what happens in Nevada. I'm not as confident about Nevada as anymore, considering what we've seen there. But you can easily start messing around. So Michigan obviously would put him completely over the top here without needing a Nevada and without needing New Hampshire. That's the potential path he now has. This assumes that Iowa goes his way, too. We still haven't had. But if Ohio went his way, you got to assume that Iowa is going to go there, too. So, look. I come back here, Michigan, she's now going to need Michigan, say, and a New Hampshire or a Nevada, certainly there. But essentially, as Nicole is right, each state is now important to both of them. This is no longer, oh, you know, she's got all these paths to 270. No, she doesn't. Her path to 270 is Pennsylvania, Michigan, and either Nevada or New Hampshire. And she has to win three of those four. And two of those three can't be Nevada and New Hampshire. This is, this is uh, Savannah, what? Give me your take on that. Well, I think, as, as Chuck just said, I mean, this is firewall time. And you look at some of these states and you see that there's the Hillary Clinton headquarters and they're cheering for Virginia and they're cheering for Colorado. These are two states that they were so confident given. about that they stopped spending money in them back in August. I mean, it's just a complete sea change. And I think w w people are going to say, how, w how did this happen? How did polls miss it so much? And I think they it, we're going to find out that they severely underestimated that rural vote, the white non-college educated voter turning out in a much bigger number and perhaps we're going to be looking at the African-American vote being depressed in certain areas and that that's going to be the difference. That's I hate, to bring, up, I hate to bring up a name that, that you can't. This race changed when Director Comey made that initial thing. Yeah. That's when Republicans galvanized. Mm -hmm. You noted, Nicole, that's when Trump became a good candidate for the first time that's in right. weeks. Yeah. But the look republicans coming home is the other story here not only in the uh, not only have we seen in the excerpts blowing through the roof the trump voter but as bill as bill noted um your college educated white voter she's doing well but she's not doing as well as they expected. It doesn't so cancel out what he got. And, and listen, this was always out of reach for him when he was fighting with his own party. That's why it was viewed as so calamitous when he went to war with Republicans. The intra-party fighting was viewed as disastrous. But that hasn't really been the case for the last few weeks. The closing weeks of this campaign have had Republicans, even Paul Ryan, who we were talking about in the last hour, singing off of the same and song sheet about healthcare. Clinton corruption. Don't forget health care either. Exactly, they, huge they, story. You know, when, when those premiums went up, they obviously their research said go after it because he hammered, hammered, hammered health care. With an assist from Bill Clinton, who said, you know, we all know this, this, this law, you know, he said something derogatory about Obamacare, which gave them, them fuel, gave them ammunition. And what was different about the post Comey period was that he had ammunition and he used it. He'd been a very inefficient candidate until that moment. When the Comey letter hit, he became a very efficient, a very disciplined, almost a traditional kind of candidate. And this is what it yielded. Kevin Tibbles is in Michigan right now. Kevin, what's the move where you are and what are people talking about? Well, Lester, I think it's one of amazement and perhaps a little bit of surprise thrown in because people here last night were attending one of the final uh, Donald Trump rallies here. At any point, did you ever think that Michigan, it might actually come down to Michigan? Never. I never thought it would happen. And, and what about you? I mean, Michigan did not seem to be in play. This was supposed to be a Democrat state. We were ready to be in play. We were excited for something new and different. And well, Donald Trump is that person. Well, what, is he, what does Donald Trump represent to you that is different? He tells it like it is. He isn't politically correct, which is sometimes good and sometimes not. But you know where he's coming well, from. Well, I have to ask you, as a woman, why did you vote for him? Because he tells it like it is. I have a lot of friends who tell it like it is, and you can trust them. You have to sort through some of the weeds, but when you get to the gist of it, you know he's speaking strong words and that he's going to live up to those words. This was a rather subdued crowd up until about 45 minutes ago, Lester, and that's when the results started to come in. I think people here got excited when they saw what was going on in Ohio, which of course I believe is still too close to call. And then it started coming in here. People started talking about the number of people that voted in the Detroit area, which seemed to be low. And then here, which has been a Republican sort of island in this, in this state of Michigan. But uh, after this evening, I mean, who knows? 
It's all up in the air. Who knows what's going to happen here, Lester? All right, Kevin Tillis, thanks very much. And I know in the crush of that room and the noise you may have missed, but Ohio has been called as a, a Donald Trump state. Uh, Donald Trump wins Ohio. And let's, let's, cr let's drill down on Ohio because it may be uh, Hallie Jackson because it may tell us a little bit what else is going on in the Midwest. And here's what we're seeing in Ohio, which could be reflected in Michigan, which is another one of these upper Midwest states and obviously the one we're talking about tonight. Look at this. It wasn't immigration. It wasn't foreign policy or terrorism that ended up giving Trump the win. According to our exit polls, it was the economy. 54% of Ohio voters said that was the most important issue to them. And of the voters who said that the economy was the most important issue, and actually of Ohio voters overall, more of them thought that Donald Trump would better handle the economy. His message on trade seemed to resonate. This is something that we heard from Trump in the closing months of his campaign in the last few weeks as he made trip after trip after trip to Ohio, pressing this message. The other thing, driving his victory in Ohio, he is the projected winner there. Take a look at this next board here. It's what we've been talking about all night. White voters without a college degree. Look at the margin for the Republican candidate. In 2012, it was 56%. Donald Trump outperformed Mitt Romney this year. And look at what happened with the Democratic candidate. In 2012, Barack Obama got 42%. Hillary Clinton underperformed him by five points. So that is something that we're going to look to see if that is matched in Michigan, given the similarities between the populations there, Lester. Hallie Jackson, thanks. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to continue to keep a close eye on those two close-to-call states, and there are many of them. And another round of poll closings coming up, including a big one, California. Stay with us. It's 1045 in the east in a uh, little over 14 minutes. Uh, more poll closings, California, Hawaii, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. And, of course, we'll have the characterizations at the top of the hour. I want to go to Kristen Welker now. She's learned some new, new information at Clinton headquarters here in New York. Kristen? Lester, good evening. The Clinton campaign projecting confidence in this nail-biter of a race. I just heard from one top official who says they still have a path to 270, and they say they are on that path. Why? Because they have won Colorado and Virginia. But the path includes holding Wisconsin and Michigan. They would then have to win Pennsylvania and either win Nevada or New Hampshire. So those are the states that they are watching at this hour. Now, they point out that in terms of Wisconsin, Madison is still out. That's obviously a heavy college area, so you're going to get younger voters. They think they can clinch that area. And then Michigan, Detroit is out. A lot of African-American voters. Of course, President Obama has been there trying to energize his base and that part of the Obama coalition. I can tell you that there are jitters here among top Clinton supporters who are gathered at the Javits Center, some of them acknowledging to me they are quite concerned about the fact that this race is a whole lot closer than they were anticipating. But again, at this hour, the Clinton campaign stressing that they still have a path to 270 and they think they can get there. Lester. Listening to that path, Kristen, we're sending uh, Chuck with his pad and up to the map here. Well, look, the path is the path is one state right now. I mean, yes, we may need to worry. We'll worry about Nevada and, and, and New Hampshire when we get there. And Wisconsin, um, she noted. In Wisconsin, there's no doubt. But let's get to know Michigan a little bit here. Um, we still got, look, more than 50 percent of the vote out. But ultimately, let's take a look at what Wayne County is going to do. So right now, Clinton is winning it. Um, almost by 30 points. Let's go back to 2012 just to get an idea of the total vote that you'll see out of it. So we have 220,000 votes in there so far. If you go to Wayne in 2012, as you see President Obama won it by almost 50 points. He got nearly, oh, 370,000 net out of there. So my point is that's what you're going to be wanting to watch tonight. Number one is going to be how much, oh, it looks like, there we go. How much does she get out of here? Still very little of Detroit in, but she needs to net. Doesn't need to net as much as, as Obama got out of there, but she needs to net probably 275 to 300,000 votes just out of Wayne County. So we got a ways to go, but that's just a simple way of just watching Michigan right now. Why are you at the map? Can you show us where Florida is? We haven't we, Yeah, we haven't, we haven't checked Florida in on Florida a, a little bit. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and go to it here. Um, I didn't. I'm Sorry to put you that on the for, spot. No, that's okay. I didn't. I, I, I could have navigated simpler. Look, vote keeps coming in. She hasn't really narrowed the gap very well. It's just not there. Unless there's magic boxes of, of ballot boxes somewhere that we don't know about, I can keep telling you there is, you know, the remaining vote is basically here in Palm Beach, Broward, 
uh, Miami, and I think there's one precinct in Monroe that's left. But by the way, I was talking to a, a, a Florida uh, a Florida expert of mine about how how has Trump done this, and it's essentially these Tampa ex-urban counties, okay, both north and south, in the Tampa market. He just blew through every single vote total estimate that Democrats had, and frankly, even Republicans just blew through. Look, she did her job in uh, Hillsborough. Normally, how Hillsborough goes, single most, you could say it was the most important swing county in the country over the last 16 years. But this is not enough. She's going to win Hillsborough and lose the state. That doesn't happen very often, but that's the story of what's happened in rural America. By the way, everybody talking about how Trump didn't have much of a get out the vote operation. But <laughs> didn't need it. Apparently not, that he relied so heavily on the Republican Party and there was already grousing um, from some inside states about there not being sufficient get out the vote. Well, the vote got out. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a break. Lots more ahead on this decision night in America. Well, welcome back. We are watching a nail-biter of a presidential race. We knew this was going to be a close race, but it is going to come far closer and far earlier in the evening than many certainly had anticipated, and the yeah. reaction is being felt far and wide. Tom, you were just saying something. We continue to watch uh, the Dow futures. Well, I was just looking at the night of 9-11, after, you know, after we, we absorbed what had happened that day, they were down uh, 690 vo uh, points. Right now, they're down 750 points. That's 60 points more as a result of what they're seeing so far. That's Wall Street making its bet, hedging its bets at this point about what is likely to happen. And, you know, if you look at these, they think that Trump is going to be the president. As, as uh, Florida seems to be slipping away from Clinton and the path certainly for Trump becoming a lot easier. Well, I mean, I don't speak fluent CNBC, but I mean, Wall Street, we all know, hates uncertainty. and. I think most financial experts will tell you Wall Street had not priced in a Trump win. I mean, there was the expectation that Hillary Clinton would win. So right. I think what we're seeing here is Wall Street reacting to the uncertainty. What would it mean? Because this is not something that the markets had really considered as a true possibility. Although we but did it, but see. But it went the other way when Comey when came Comey on Sunday. Sunday. It That's did, right. but then it bounced back. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it briefly priced it in and then priced it out. That's why we're seeing this fluctuation. But the polls, it's interesting, the polls didn't really identify a Comey effect, even though you kind of felt it. Well, look, we never, we still will never know, okay? The point is, was it natural closing that we were all witnessing? Or did, I mean, or did Comey sort of galvanize the Republican base to say, oh, yeah, that's why I don't like her. I had somebody text me and just say, perhaps Democrats, and this was a Democrat saying this, perhaps Democrats underestimated the dislike for Hillary Clinton out there. The assumption was Trump's dislike would she, trump hers. She's really not. Um, right. But that is not what's happening. It's yeah. essentially, you heard, if you dislike both of them, you were more likely to vote Trump than Clinton. And I think they thought in the dislike both of them game that they would win that. And our exit poll showed they were almost, people almost had them even in terms of uh, untruthfulness and on, on honesty yeah, we, question. We do have to be careful here. We don't have the final results yet. You no. know, and we have, you know, we have to work our way through them. Uh, we, but, but the Tom, the, it's important, even if she wins now, this is a different, this is an impactful result. Oh, no, no, I agree with that. And I think even if she wins now, it'll be contested, is what I think. I think there'll be an automatic challenge to it, given the way that Donald Trump operates, and it'll be close enough for him to say, hey. It's legitimate to do it. It could be that close. Right. I, I really think it's going to come to that, whatever the results are. What's so. interesting is, is that when we polled, it's remarkably consistent. Trump had high negatives, slightly higher than Hillary Clinton's, but both extremely negative opinions from the public. However, it seems like voters were willing to say, as long as Donald Trump remains a protest vote, we're going to stick with him. Yeah. All right. We have a lot more ahead, so we invite you to stay with us. Decision Night in America continues right here on NBC. Well, most of our, all of our local races uh, are decided, but uh, in New York, the Clinton uh, supporters and the Trump supporters are still waiting to, uh, to see who's going to be celebrating and who's going to be commiserating. Both of them are on pins and needles, too. Mm -hmm. This contest has been a lot closer than any of us ever expected. It looks like we're going to be here for a while. And as a matter of fact, we are now going to send it back to New York.
This is just NBC another News. story. Good. Green Bay, a Trump county at this point. Excuse me, let me show you here in a big, big way. That's just one reason why Wisconsin is on a knife edge. And this is a state right now that uh, the folks of the Clinton camp say is, is integral to their path to victory in the t and the 270. We are going to take a short break. We continue our coverage of this very dramatic night. Several races too close to call. We may not know the answer uh, to this uh, this drama for a very very long time. We'll be back from New York after this. Decision Night in America continues. I'm Chanel Jones in the NBC News Washington Bureau. The polls are now closed in all states except Alaska. And NBC News still has Florida in the too close to call column. But let's take a look. Donald Trump has picked up a big victory projected to win in North Carolina. Idaho, take a look at this one, also goes to Trump. Hillary Clinton, meanwhile, is now projected to win the state of Colorado, as well as West Coast states, California. Look at these results with 55 electoral votes. Oregon with seven electoral votes. Washington, we see here with 12 electoral votes. And the Aloha State, Hawaii, picking up four electoral votes. Let's dig in here. Joining us now from Miami, Florida, is Mariana Atencio, who was at a watch party. Mariana, set the stage for us. What's going on there in Florida? Hey, Chanel, I'm here at a local watch party in Miami with Latino families, and the families here are mixed status. Many of them have undocumented people in their families, citizens who voted, or even family members who were deported. And as these results start to come in, these families are grappling with what could be the mm. outcome, the fact that Donald Trump could, in fact, be elected president. They are assimilating these results. Uh, young people like Valerie here, Valerie, you... Are here all alone in the U.S. You've been here for 10 months. Your parents were deported to Colombia. What are you feeling now as, as these results come in? Right now, I'm really nervous because I see that Trump is winning. And knowing that Trump is winning, uh, it's like a possibility that my parents can come back again. So right now, Hillary is my hope for, my, for me and my family to be together again. What would you tell... Donald Trump supporters and even Donald Trump himself about people like you and, and your family? Well, I'm 16 years old and I think I still need my parents' support with me because I'm alone and as well as other kids and other families, we need to be together. Thank you so much, Valerie. You are very brave. And Chanel, uh, Nora is joining me here. She's a legal guardian to Valerie and many kids in, in her situation. And as again, as these results start to come in, we have seen the mood really tense in here. People holding hands, praying, uh, praying for, for what outcome, mm -hmm. Nora, for, for families like the ones we are with now? We, we are praying for the best for our children. We have 1,007 children who are alone or under uh, your care a thousand children care. yes and because they are orphan <laughs> father or mother or both has been deported and uh, uh, we are here just waiting for uh, the last decision and whoever is the next president uh, we will continue our fight to protect our children and the immigrant families Thank you so much, Nora, for your testimony. Many Latino families across the country with the more than 11 million undocumented people here in the United States having these same discussions and going through these same feelings, Chanel, across the country tonight. Mariana, those were great interviews. Thanks for checking in with us, and we'll talk to you again a little later this evening. I want to bring in Jennifer Lawless from American University. Let's compare... Mariana's live report with some of the live reports we've watched all evening long where they're jubilant, they're excited. This is seriously almost like a tale of two different countries, a divided country. It is, and we basically saw this play out over the course of the campaign how women fare in the United States and what their future looks like, how blacks and Latinos will fare and what their future looks like, how college educated versus uneducated people will fare and what their future looks like. It really is a tale of two countries and we're seeing in the battleground states that it's still too close to call. When we dig into the numbers here, I looked up this morning, the Latina vote, the early vote, it nearly doubled from four years ago. I mean, they really had so many campaigns with their, their ground initiatives. Why is this so close? What happened? 
It's unclear. I mean, a lot of the time we don't really know what to do with the early vote. Is that the enthusiastic vote and then everybody else just doesn't turn out on Election Day? But as of right now, it looks like it's possible that Trump actually did better with Latinos than Mitt Romney did. And finally, what does Hillary Clinton, let's, let's just in case, you know, people are still tuning in, they're flipping around. What does Hillary Clinton have to pull off in order to win tonight? She needs to win Michigan. If she wins Michigan, then we can talk about the next steps. But without Michigan, there's no path. Surprised? I, I'm surprised. You know, I think I was, a lot of people are surprised. My phone is exploding really quickly. A lot of people are saying, uh, James Comey, did he give Trump a lifeline? I think he gave him multiple lifelines. The fact that Trump is winning in most of these battleground states when the polls suggested that that was not the case is evidence of that. All right. Thank you, Jennifer Lawless. There are a number of important ballot initiatives across the country we have to talk about, including those dealing with marijuana and gun control. We will update you on those when we see you back here in 30 minutes. For now, though, we send it back to Lester Holt in New York for continuing coverage of Decision Night in America. It is 1130 in the East, and as we look at Democracy Plaza, NBC News projecting that Donald Trump is the apparent winner in Florida. Donald Trump, the apparent winner in Florida. It's a state that he called a must-win, and he appears to be winning it. 29 electoral votes. Let's show you the vote count right now as it stands. 49% uh, Trump, 48% Clinton. That's the vote, current vote count, 96% of the vote in, in Florida. Now, we, we also want to uh, tell you that uh, Utah, now we're getting a call on Utah, the state of Utah, the projected winner is Donald Trump in Utah. And let's look at the uh, how the vote... The votes break down in Utah. Okay, we're going to walk you through some of the other calls we made. You were away in your local coverage. California projected for Hillary Clinton. Hawaii for uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, Idaho is won by Donald Trump, the projected winner in Idaho. Oregon will go to Hillary Clinton. Clinton also the projected winner in Washington. And as we had noted earlier, uh, Trump, the projected winner in North Carolina. So let's take you down uh, on the ice and show you where the race to 270 stands right now. First, oh, oh, I'm sorry, we got a new one. This is a new projection in the state of Iowa. Donald Trump wins in Iowa. All right, now let's take you. There's the, there's the breakdown in Iowa right now. 50% Trump, 44% for Clinton. Now I think we can take you down and show you where things stand in the race to 270. Big change there with that last round. 228 for Trump, 209 for Clinton as more and more states are now filled in. Some big ones still outstanding there. We continue to watch that will likely turn this race one way or the other. Let's go right now. Uh, by the way, this is the, uh, this is the view at Clinton headquarters, obviously reacting to that news in, in Florida. Long faces... Uh, at this uh, at this viewing party here, uh, this is Clinton headquarters in New York, uh, not far from where the uh, the Trump folks are gathered right now. Let's go to Andrea Mitchell. She is there, Andrea. Well, you're showing the faces, the stunning information as it's been progressing here of Donald Trump winning Iowa, which was pretty much anticipated, and Florida. But this is such a narrow path. And for all this time, we've been talking about the multiple paths that she had and the narrow path that he had. And clearly, that was a misjudgment by all of the conventional wisdom. So pollsters missed it, correspondents missed it. Uh, all of the analysis, the focus My on the early vote, was which was clearly misplaced because we were attributing too much weight to the early vote and not counting what was still out there. Andrea Mitchell at the Clinton headquarters where there has been a sharp reaction to that news that Florida has gone to Donald Trump. It is the opposite reaction, I can assure you, at the Trump headquarters. That's where Katie Turr is now. Katie? It is absolutely the opposite reaction. They're chanting USA, USA, USA here. The mood only grows happier 
by the minute. I can tell you earlier, only a couple hours ago, this room was relatively empty as the electoral map looked pretty daunting for Donald Trump. And as one, state by state has fallen into his camp, this room is only growing more excited. They really feel like Donald Trump has a very good chance of winning. And they feel vindicated in this idea that Donald Trump was speaking for them when nobody else was. I've met a ton of people across this country who not only say that Donald Trump says what they think, they like that he tells it like it is, but they wanted somebody that would go in and shake up Washington, really give it to Washington, if you will. Somebody who would cut through the red tape, cut through the drama between the two sides and just get things done. They believe that he is somebody who will be able to do things with the sweep of his hand, somebody who will be able to build a wall, somebody who will be able alone to stop radical Islamic terror. He's come out and he's spoken very strongly against a lot of things and, and broken a ton of traditional norms in this country, said things that no other candidate could have possibly said and survived, and yet he has. And looking back on this, I would say that the moment that he didn't call John McCain a war hero and his poll numbers surged after that, that should have been an eye-opening moment for everybody in this country that nothing was going to apply to Donald Trump like it applied to everybody else. We saw this in the primaries. We saw this now so far during this general election as his poll numbers have stayed pretty tight with Donald, with Hillary Clinton, despite the various outrageous statements that he has made, despite the various uh, controversies, despite uh, saying that a Mexican judge was biased because of his heritage, despite attacking a Gold Star family, despite saying that he could grope women because he was a celebrity, despite multiple women coming out against him and saying that he uh, touched them inappropriately or acted inappropriately to him. He has survived all of that. And now his campaign looks, feels like they really have a very good shot of winning this race. All right, Katie Turr, thanks very much. We want to go now to former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani, who has become a powerful surrogate, certainly for uh, Donald Trump. Uh, Mayor, react to what you're seeing so far. Florida has well, gone I'm in. Well, I'm enormously excited for the country. I believe Donald Trump will be a uh, truly great president. This is probably one of the greatest victory for the people of America since Andrew Jackson. I mean, this is against the entire establishment. Democrat, Republican, corporate, Wall Street, the media. I mean, 90% of the media lined up against them. Four or five stories a day in the New York Times. Today, four of them negative about him. Uh, and the I'll, people I'll of America... I'll, and the I'll, I'll remind America, you, he's at 228 uh, electoral votes, so not quite victory yet. Uh, we're not there yet, but we're getting there, and it sure shows the power of the people. How much do you think that the the Comey story played into what we're seeing right now? I don't know that it played very much into it. I think everyone had already made up their minds about Mrs. Clinton and the long period of time in which the Clintons had committed a number of serious crimes that were ignored by the Washington establishment. Perjury, whitewater, so the, the, the Mark Rich pardon, which to me was enormously in, upsetting because I prosecuted Mark Rich and he was the number one fugitive in the country and they got $30 million for that. Selling uranium to Russia. I think those are the things that really brought her down more than the, uh, what Comey did. Comey's report played a big role in it. But I think Donald Trump's outreach to the people is the main thing here. You have to have been at his rallies and seen the way people reacted to him. I told him at the first rally that I was at that he was going to win this election Mr. because he reached the people. Mr. Giuliani, uh, if, if Donald Trump is triumphant tonight, uh, your name has been mentioned as a, as a possible cabinet member. What position would you want in a, in a Trump administration? Right, right, now, right now, I'm not even thinking about that. I'm enormously happy at my law firm, my security firm. I do cybersecurity, which is unbelievably challenging and I'm just happy to see that my country is in good hands and not in the hands it might have been in if uh, we made a mistake and let's hope we get there you're right we're not quite there yet yeah so we're not quite there there's still, a lot of a lot of I'm, drama left I'm, in this night uh, I'm still I'm still praying 
Mayor Giuliani and, and your and your wife, thank you so much for uh, for taking thank the time, you. and and uh, we'll see how thank the evening progresses. Much. I want to go over to uh, Chuck Todd right now, who's gathered with some of the analysts, uh, working through some of what we've seen so far. Uh, President Trump may be something that everybody needs to get used to, including the Republican Party. And I have to say here, here's three people, smart minds in the Republican Party, and I think we all thought it couldn't happen. That he couldn't do this on the power of white voters alone. That he couldn't do what he did. And guess what? He may just do it. Mike Murphy, what did you miss? Oh boy, I missed a lot. Um, under the normal rules of politics, he couldn't put it together. But he's broken the normal rules and he's getting votes he shouldn't get at a huge level among white America, where partisanship doesn't seem to have the same glue. States like Wisconsin, which are full of white Democrats who apparently in big numbers are voting for him. So uh, right now, I'm Michigan. I can see 100,000 votes for her out of Detroit. Yeah. Wisconsin, I, I don't, don't see, see it. it. I don't see it either. Yeah. Uh, no, I think I, I, you know, barring an upset in Arizona, yeah, by her, Nicole. I mean, the path, the paths are starting to get cut off for her. Yeah. So. Look, he's remade the Republican Party. Absolutely. This is no this is not Paul Ryan's party. I think Paul Ryan's days as Speaker of the House are probably over tonight yeah. because I don't see the, the, the House is going to respond differently. You elicited a moan from you. I'll yield I my time. I, I, well, I, 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 don't, I don't agree with it. I, 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 am, an, right. I, am, I am an admitted reluctant Trump voter. As yeah. I just said on uh, talking to Nicole downstairs, uh, there are millions of us. I didn't know there were that many people concerned with the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Obamacare, Arizona, your, your last yeah. effort. The premium on the silver plan in, Obama, right. in Phoenix went up 149%. And so there is a vast number. Ron Johnson winning in Wisconsin is an Obamacare vote. I think that all this is going to come down to Donald Trump will sit down with Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan, yeah. if this holds true, and they will do deals and they will get, and they will save hey, the Supreme let me, Court. Let me, throw, let me throw a little, uh, this is, because I'm sure some uh, <clears throat> Bernie bros are going to be talking about this. Does Bernie Sanders lose Wisconsin? Anybody? Who thinks Bernie Sanders would have lost Wisconsin? I think he would have probably lost Wisconsin. Just it, culturally, it, he wouldn't have connected, I think, to some of those counties. The point is, that did, did, you know, was she uniquely unable to connect yeah. to this vote? Yes. Yeah. You know? I, I want to get in on being wrong, because I think, I think you probably <laughs> yeah, get yeah, race to the bottom. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, well, yeah. the table's going to get crowded but, for yeah. <laughs> Here's one thing that, that I, I'll just speak for myself that I got wrong. I think that people's tolerance for all the unsavory things that came out of Donald Trump's mouth. I mean, he was undeniably embracing racial, racially charged language, undeniably um, misogynistic language. Yeah. Talking about grabbing a woman in the genitals is disqualifying for any other person in any other year. I did not vote for him and, and, and could never have voted for someone who said the things that he said, who banned an entire religion. I, I mean, the Republican Party is gonna have to grapple with who and what it is if he wins or loses, but, People, voters, had an incredibly high threshold for pain and, and for um, intolerance and for these sort of racial and misogynistic undertones because they thought that he might be political chemo, this thing that could wipe out the cancer that is a corrupt Washington. And so they're willing to tolerate all that bad to get some dramatic it's, it's, it's change. Actually, somebody, you said chemo. Somebody said to me, um, it's like, no, he's this... Yeah, there's only a 10% chance the pill would work, but I want to try it. Right. Also, when voters are really mad, they have a low tolerance for the baseball bat. They don't pick the prettiest one in town. They want a weapon, and he was that weapon, so they held him accountable to almost nothing. On the other hand, they don't like her. She's politics. That's you it. I, want, I just want to say, you said rejection election on my show. You're yeah. absolutely right. This is a rejection of yeah. Hillary Clinton and a tentative willingness to roll the dice, which is why I think those curbs in the form of McConnell and Ryan will mean a great deal. It is a rejection election. It will mean everything. By the way, I do, want to sh I do want to go to um, the Andrew Jackson point here, because I've thought about this, too, that he is, that he was trying to do Andrew Jackson, and I didn't think you could do Andrew Jackson. Yeah, Walter anymore. Russell Reed wrote that, and he yeah. was so practical. But absolutely, because that is how you know Andrew Jackson, yeah. the first populist to become president, and who was arguably destructive to the American economy at the time. Yeah. But the public didn't care. John Meacham's book captured that, and he ruled as he ran. He ruled as a district. And by the way, to this day, historians, some think they love Jackson and some think he was the worst Horrible. president. Yeah. If Trump wins, and I believe on these, this situation he has a better chance than not, now will come the pain, the other half. Voting to blow things up is easy. Mm -hmm. Living with that in the economy and everywhere else, look at the futures, is another story. Nicole, let me give you more P PTSD about Florida. I want to put up <laughs> a Florida. This is the four-way Florida board. A bunch of Democrats are gnawing their fingernails because look at the yeah. difference. 
between Trump and Clinton, 132,000. Mm -hmm. um, and then look at the total vote of Johnson Stein, mm -hmm. uh, 266. Now, let's not presume all Johnson voters were somehow going to go Clinton. Right. Um, but something kept them from voting right. for, for Trump because he was changed and he was outside of those. So, so, right. so we don't know. It's a known unknown. But, but there is going to be some some uh, Bernie Bros or things like that. Some yeah. Democrats yeah. are going to look for a bunch of things to gnaw on their fingernails at this one. Well, but the I fact of the matter is that I mean I was talking about show trials in the Republican Party. Now I'm going to be in the chair. Yeah. But uh, and others. But the Dems are going to have an implosion over this. All How right. Could, you, We've got. I got to interrupt you. I got to go to Lester. We got to call in Georgia. Okay. All right, we were, we're making that projection now. NBC News projects that Donald Trump wins the state of Georgia. This has gone on a lot longer than many uh, imagined it would, but 16 electoral votes, Trump wins Georgia. We also want to note uh, very quickly, well, let's, let's first of all look at the uh, where that takes us in the uh, race to 270 that puts Trump at 244. Clinton standing right now at 209. Let me just mention here very quickly, uh, Arizona, Wisconsin, those have moved to the too close to call category. We'll take a break, be back with more right after this. We're going to peek in right now at the uh, celebration that is growing at the Trump headquarters as uh, supporters there sense this may be their night uh, in the race to 270. And a much different story at the Clinton headquarters. This was uh, a bit earlier as people reacting to the news that Florida had gone Trump's way. So it is a, a tale of, of uh, two uh, halls blocks away here in New York City, interpreting and, and watching the news as it unfolds in this extremely tight presidential election. To give us some perspective on this momentous night, we welcome a pair of well-known presidential historians, Doris Kearns Goodwin and Michael Beschloss. Good to have both of you here. We always try to find some historic comparison, but is there any uh, to this uh, election? Doris? Well, I keep thinking about 1948, when every poll said that Dewey would be Truman when all the reporters who were on the train with Truman saw the intensity of the support that Truman had, but James Reston later apologized and said, I didn't take that into account. I was listening to the established view. So if this were to turn around that way, I think people talked to each other too much and didn't listen to what people outside were feeling. On the other hand, whoever wins tonight, what this shows is that there's going to be a divided country and we are going to need leadership. And the scary thing is that both, both candidates people don't feel are trustworthy and more than ever we're going to need somebody who can heal these divisions. Gore helped to do it in 2000. I remember that night with Tom Brokaw. We were waiting up forever and ever and ever and somehow he was able to be graceful. Whoever wins or loses tonight is going to have to show that leadership and on the other side that grace and classiness. Well, and, and I worry and, whether that's going to happen. Yeah, and let's talk, let me talk to Michael about that. One of these two candidates is going to have to make a, or is going to be expected to make a concession speech at the end of this right. night. Uh, right. Given that they were both are both immensely unpopular and as, as Doris points out that uh, the country more than ever needs someone to lead us through uh, through this split, what would you expect? Well, whoever is president is going to have to heal and unite this country, and that would have been true at the end of this campaign in any case. But, you know, I think, Lester, one other thing we have to remember that perhaps is a little bit forgotten, and that is that if you look through American history, it is almost never the case that one political party is able to hold on to the White House three terms in a row. You know, uh, Martin Van Buren was able to be elected as Andrew Jackson's successor, 1836. If you're looking at a vice president who was able to do that, you have to go all the way ahead to George H.W. Uh, Bush in 1988, elected to essentially Ronald Reagan's third term. Dwight Eisenhower, although very popular, was not able to hand the White House to Richard Nixon, nor was Bill Clinton, who was at the end of his presidency quite popular, able to do the same thing for Al Gore. So I think we may be seeing <clears throat> some form of that syndrome tonight. Do you, do you, you know, we look at the polls, and, and, and depending how this turns out, we may look at the polls and say what happened. But is it harder to measure an electorate where so many people are voting against the other person, when so many people are holding their nose and saying, well, this is all I got, let me choose one. Uh, how do you factor in that gut check, that moment of, of doing something you don't want to do? And I think we're used to that in a primary situation, which are usually protest moments. 
we're less used to that in a general election because normally you assume that by the time people come to a general election, they've chosen one candidate over another. And I think 